A lot of people go through life doing things badly. Racing's important to men who do it well. When you're racing, it, it's life. Anything that happens before or after, just wait. Pat Williams got a brilliant start from the third row of the grid. His goal is hit him, he's straight off at the chase. And a half second lead over the center and cut the background. He has it. Oh, he's found, he's round, he's round on the last lap. There's a massive, massive accident. Next to the inside, what a move. Hello and welcome everybody to round number one of the Automobilista Australia Supercars Championship for 2020. If you missed last week, well, you missed a cracking qualifying session and top 10 shootout, which we'll show you some highlights very, very shortly. But yesterday and the day before, and in fact last week, they are all distant memories. Tonight, it's all about the 250 kilometre race around the streets of Adelaide. That's right, 78 laps the distance. Looking like it's going to be a three-stop strategy tonight. Throw in some safety cars, throw in a few different weird and wonderful things and wonderful quirks about this Adelaide Parkland street circuit. And you've got yourselves a nice old barn burner of a race. So it's going to go... As we said, for 78 laps, the longest race we've done around the Adelaide Street Circuit. Of course, last year it was a 55-lap encounter that ran for 200, sorry, for uh, 150 kilometres. I do apologise. 150 k's was the distance last year. So we've upped that this year to 250. A few people just starting to get themselves organised and into the server for tonight's proceedings. We are short a couple of drivers from the qualifying session from last week but we hope to still have a pretty healthy turnout for what is the effectively the opening round of this year's championship. My name is Steve DeVries. As always, I am accompanied by the man they dubbed the Encyclopedia of All Things Supercars here at Automobilista Australia, and that's Hans Brunswick, who is just on his way in as we speak. So he won't be too far away from picking up the microphone and hearing his wonderful voice. In fact, it just recently graduated from university as Hans Brunswick, and I can actually hear him just making his way upstairs into the commentary box as we speak. So hopefully it won't be too much longer until he is ready and raring to go. Well, we will have a little bit of a lull just while the the broadcast team get themselves together, also while the driver's briefing is being conducted. It's a bit more of a... A formality now from last year, all the drivers just being told about who has right of way into turn number eight, of course, that's usually the man who is ahead at the 150 metre board, will have right of way into turn eight, that very, very fast right hander on the back side of the circuit. The scene of so much carnage in a number of categories, and who can forget things like Greg Tara's wild moment there in GT3. Of course, there was also a GT3 moment there last year where we had Lewis Wedding giving one of the drivers a quite a nice hurry up around the corner, literally bump drafting him around that particular corner and we thought he was actually going into the fence. So it can be a source of carnage, but it can also be a source of some great overtaking manoeuvres as well. If you want to play chicken with somebody, that is certainly the place to do it. Well, let's have a quick look at the qualifying recap. If you missed it from last week, this is precisely what you missed. So getting proceedings underway was Brenton Foley. He was the defending champion from last year in Automobilista Australia Supercars, so carrying the number one. He hadn't had much track time at all, so he got out there very, very quickly. People like Cam Rutledge's CRE Motorsport Electrical team have quadrupled their cars from the beginning of last year, one car to two cars to four cars this year. Good to see some of the other old cars from old supercar days gone past. So Steve Burko in the Volvo S60, one of two Volvos that will be taking part in things this year for the Top Gear Racing Stable was out there. Ultimately, he would miss the cutoff for the Top 10 shootout. Likewise, Blake Tilbrook, the Mercedes E63 supercar out there as well. Lou Simsport have gone out with a six-car assault with the satellite team as well. The source of all things in this qualifying happened to be down here at the hairpin. So all the sorts of little incidents were in the first part of the circuit. Our eventual pole sitter, Kurt Stenberg, no, uh, not a victim to that as well, making a mistake at the hairpin there. Likewise, Blake Tilbrook and a number of drivers struggling to come to grips with the final corner, as well as the third corner. Brian Walsh is not taking part tonight. 
having a pretty major drama and he wasn't the only one to be bitten by the turn one two three complex it was also defending champion Brenton Foley getting all out of shape as well and backing it into the fence but provisionally taking pole and the last spot in the top 10 shoot despite a little airy moment out of the final corner here was Kurt Stenberg and setting a new track record in the process of 117 293 and then we started getting down to business top 10 shootout Termo was the first man out the super cheap auto entry loose sim sport were represented by three cars in the shootout two from the loose sim sport stable one from the HDS racing stable in the form of Mitch Hathaway as our video just takes a little bit of a, a turn there Thomas Paul and Scott Nolan unfortunately went out in the wrong order in the shootout but the positions have been held so that was a little bit of a technical gremlin for those guys Devonish threw down a pretty impressive marker to try and snatch pole away from eventual pole sitter but it unfortunately wasn't to be for CRE motorsport driver pole went to this man fastest in the qualifying fastest in the shootout and Kurt Stenberg put his number 47 Trans Tasman Racing Motorsport Commodore onto the front row with pole position. And we see him in the beautiful navigation of the turn one to chicane. So your the upshot of all that qualifying results is Kurt Stenberg's new track record, 117.293. And this is how they ended up after the 20-minute qualifying session. And, of course, Steve Burko displaced out of the top 10 aboard the Volvo very late by Cam Rutledge's Commodore. And, unfortunately, Aaron Thomas also on his return to competition. Not a very happy hunting ground for him. Over the page we go. And here were the remaining drivers and how they finished out the qualifying session. Dwayne Davies driving a Commodore, something he's not used to. He drove a Ford last year. And, of course, the two back markers at the back, Brian Walsh and Glenn Miles, bringing up the rear in the Scuderia Alitalia FGX Falcons. And then we went down to the shootout results, and you'll be able to see as this flips over exactly how that all panned out. So you can see here there were four drivers that gained a spot, second man out, by the time everything was all said and done. But it was Kurt Stenberg's 117.948. And Foley and Devonish awfully close to changing rows there between the rows one and two they were the closest along with Thomas Paul they were the ones that were the closest out of all the drivers when it was all finished at the end of the night's proceedings now it's time to welcome aboard Hans Brunswick Hans finally a good evening oh good evening to you Stephen good evening to everyone uh, watching out there but uh, I just came back from a function and uh, I, now not me personally but everyone else was drinking but let me tell you just because the booze was flowing there doesn't mean the party got started the party gets started tonight here for the 20 2020 supercars automobilista Australia season and it's the Adelaide 250 I'm really excited for this Steve well, I'm excited for the fact that you're in an actual suit here in broadcast commentary because, of course, this function, so to speak, was your graduation. So very many congratulations on behalf of the Automobilista Australia admins for graduating from university and good to see you moving up in the world. And hopefully on to bigger and better things, but for the moment, supercars action tonight. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I think I'd rather the supercars action tonight. I can get my mind off uh, work and study and all the academia and things like that. And uh, we're going to get into some pretty exciting things at the moment. So right now we're going to we're just about to switch to the uh, free practice session just before the, or the warm up rather. And uh, we're just seeing a couple of cars go out now. First car out and tracking the warm up. Uh, short warm up. It's uh, Cam Rutledge in the uh, CRE Motorsport Pro B car. So he's heading up the Pro B uh, team for CRE Electrical Racing and uh, pretty good performance by Cam to get into the top 10 shootout Steve I thought he got in there with, a, with the nick of time he actually bumped out Dwayne Davies so um, I reckon Cam Rutledge one to watch he didn't get the most out of the car but uh, it, there's a few CRE cars up in the top 10 I believe there's three of them so a pretty good showing from CRE in the opening event of the season the opening shootout but uh, can they convert from what has been a pretty good uh, shootout for them it certainly has been a good shootout for CRE. Yours Cam gets it all wrong at turn eight. Big, big man of curb there, and round goes the number zero one five. So he sung his praises, and he's unfortunately ended up going around there at turn 
number eight. So the electrician with Electrified under the rear wing was, uh, was looking pretty good there in the warm-up session. Of course, this warm-up session being used to just program the grid for the 78 lap encounter that lies ahead. And we're just waiting on confirming if a few people can actually get into the server to make this happen. Uh, there are a few drivers that are missing from tonight's proceedings. So Thomas Paul was one of the drivers that qualified uh, up the pointy end, I think fourth or fifth in the top ten shootout. So he's unfortunately missing tonight. Likewise, a couple of our combatants from the Western Australian region of Australia over in Perth, they are unfortunately a bit of a victim of the daylight savings sometimes. So a few of them are hoping to make it for the next round. Otherwise, we're going to have to wait till the daylight savings finishes here in Victoria in about five weeks time or so so for the moment Cam doing probably what he needs to be doing and that's practicing the starts one of the most important things in Automobilista Australia supercars is getting these big heavy cars off the line especially with a full tank of fuel as we cycle through the field and he looks like he's the only one out there at the moment everybody else pretty much in the garage so in actual fact, that is what's going on. Pretty much everybody else is parked up, so there really isn't much activity going on, Hans, um, as the timer is pretty much about to expire. So hopefully we're not far away from a race start here. Yeah, the timer's just reset itself right now, actually, so we might be on to the next session. But uh, Cam Rutledge, not half as silly as we thought spinning at turn eight because uh, it's actually a good time to find the limits, unlike you know, Sunday morning warm-up in a real race. Uh, you obviously don't want to crash the car in real life, but here you can because you can just hit the reset button. I guess that's... I mean, I know we all bang on about, and it's funny because simulators, we all bang on about um, uh, getting the tyre and being grip-limited on the tyre and all that sort of stuff about uh, actually driving the cars. But a lot of the outside of the racing simulator stuff, actually driving the car, it's not really a simulation because... Obviously, he would be going back home on the flatbed truck if that m was real life. But uh, uh, he can hit the reset button and we go again. But it's a good strategy in these uh, simulators to be able to find the limit and see what the limit is when you arrive at that corner, lap one, cold tyres, cold brakes, what, how far you can drive deep into it. Cam Rutley just found the limit. So uh, let's see if he's going to be electrified on the first lap. Steve. For his sake, I think he would hope to be electrified on the first lap. He wouldn't be electric off the starting line. And likewise, looking here, seeing the likes of Brent Foley in the pit lane, just starting to practice their starts as well. And that's a beauty, actually. Gets away very, very cleanly. So he'll be off the front row of the grid alongside our pole sitter of Kurt Stenberg. That's one thing you want to do. You want to be ahead getting into the first chicane because you don't want to be out over those curves and racking up a track cut. Now, I'm not sure what the track violations are set to, either four or five, I imagine. And that'll be a, a bone of contention tonight as well, how these track cuts will come into play. There are a couple of corners that you can take and get away with it. Sometimes in the race session, it is a little bit more lenient. Turn one and two is especially notorious for it if you step out of line. The other one is down at turn 11. We'll point that out to you just as Foley continues this lap to show you what, where precisely turn 11 is. So that's turn eight. Now down to turn nine, the hairpin. So the double left-hander coming up is the second of the two left-hand corners. And it's a little bit of a, an unusual one. So you go through here, flat chat. It's this one here. So Foley has taken that one absolutely perfectly. You just want to run your, your left-hand side tires over the curb. You do not want to put them on the back side of that curb. It's come up in TCR quite a number of times before. It's also come up in supercars and GT3 where you can very quickly rack up a curb strike by taking a little bit too much curb and being a little bit too aggressive with that corner. See, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that because I think the racing surface, it is, yes, it's between the yellow lines and, you know, it's to the, to the outer edge of the yellow line. Now, they should be able to drive up... Uh, with one wheel in contact with the race surface. If no wheels are in contact with the race surface, then he's clearly had it, having a track cut, just like we saw just through turn one, the first part of the center chicane there. But if all four wheels are not in contact with the racing surface, fair enough. But if there's one wheel in contact with the racing surface, it doesn't matter how much curb he's taking. If there's at least one wheel in contact with the racing surface, I think that shouldn't be considered a track cut. But then again, the, uh, the yellow lines in this case, or the white lines in every other circuit we go to, 
they do mark the edge of the circuit and yes the curbs are technically outside of the circuit but there are some liberties that you're able to take uh, with positioning the car in order to get a good run if your car is set up to take a lot of curb and with these cars it's ideal that you do take a lot of curb to help them turn put some more weight on the outside tire then uh, being able to drive to that uh, level is very important steve yeah, it certainly is. And look, I intend to, I'm inclined to agree with you, especially as we probably comes up to that corner again. There he is. He put a little bit on the back side of that curve th that time around as well. I guess this is probably probably practicing not just so much his starts, but also practicing his pit in procedure as well. We've seen quite a few people overshoot the pit lane entry. And I think we actually saw that from memory during uh, ASC on Tuesday night as well. There was one or two cars that overshot pit lane entry which as our fellow commentators over in Adelaide Stairs and Mabbert alluded to is the, the David Coulthard uh, manoeuvre going a bit too deep into the run in for the pit lane and then overshooting the mark and not being able to get back into the pit lane in a timely manner. And for those watching the Adelaide 500, the Superloop Adelaide 500 this just weekend gone, Cam Waters did the same thing as David Coulthard so the, if you do that, you are in very esteemed company, although not in real life, but in there are plenty of good racing drivers that have made that mistake in real life at this circuit. Sure have. Is there a driver we didn't see in qualifying last week? Phil Boke aboard the 046, the second of the PBF race engineering Commodores, the sister car to champion Brenton Foley. It was the two teammates that duked it out for honours last year in what was AS, sorry, the AMS Oz Super 2, with Foley taking the chocolates. In actual fact, Foley pretty much dominated the last third of that season. The Bathurst race onward uh, pretty much set up his run to the flag, and he never looked back after that. Winning in the end of the day was still mathematically an equation going into the final race of the season at Oran Park. Ultimately, Foley prevailed uh, and took a Supercars title with it. But Phil Boke, much like Brenton Foley, not a great deal of practice in the sim rig between the last race of last year and the opening race of this year. So probably a little bit of rust involved in these two drivers getting up and running tonight. And of course, as we've mentioned already, a 78 lap encounter tonight, 250 kilometres. A little bit different to how the Adelaide street circuit in real life runs its racing. They run a pair of 250k races to make up 500. The other night, ASC ran a pair of 39 lap races to make it a pair of one uh, 225 lap races to get the 250. This is a little bit different again. A full 250 case tonight is going to be very, very interesting indeed. As it looks like, we are about to get underway for the first race of Automobilista Supercars in uh, AMS Oz for 2020. Steve, uh, we're having a bit of trouble with the uh, three-letter abbreviations, mate. TLAs yeah, are RBIs. TLAs are RBIs. Three-letter abbreviations are really bad ideas, so let's stay away from them. ASC, AMS, Oz, we don't know what day it is, and we don't know which championship we're running in. But I am fairly certain we are running in the Automobilista Australia Supercars Championship. Yes, we got it out. There we go. 2020 season. We know what year it is as well, thankfully. And uh, we're just getting ready for the siding lap. And uh, Kurt Stenberg, let's see if he can convert from pole position because it was a very impressive uh, lap time, a new track record from Kurt Stenberg. I was very impressed and uh, he might be a chance to run away with it if he's really got that much uh, pace on the rest of the field. He might be a chance to run away with it, Steve. Very possible. Sighting lap commences for this 15 car field. Your pole sitter, the number 47 Trans Tasman racing of Kurt Stenberg, as you just said. New track record last week during qualifying and the top 10 shootout. Brent Foley, last year's defending champion, coming into this year with the number one aboard, the PBF Holden Racing Team car. Will Devonish, he has had his fair share of chances to take some race wins in supercars. He's gonna need that, that luck this year. Mitch Hathaway, lead uh, Ford in the pack, first of the HDS cars and on top of that part of the loose sim sports stable as well scott nolan synergy sim racing number 18 partnered with henry king is unfortunately missing this week out of p5 then come another set of angry fords zach ross 
and Pete Savage, the West Australian guys, are uh, out in force. Back to Termo, who was the first man out in the shootout and actually gained a place as a result. And Cam Rutledge was the last man in the top 10 shootout. He actually qualified 10th, has been moved up to 9th by virtue of Thomas Paul not being here tonight. Steve Burko, the first of the Volvos that are out in force tonight. Only the one running, but there is another one in the works. Dwayne Davies, PBF Bundaberg Racing Car, the satellite sister team to PBF. Billy Dougal Salonga, who actually jumped into Lewis Wedding's car last week, having had some dressing. Glenn Miles is all on his own for Scuderia Alitalia. Brian Walsh unable to take the start. Lewis Wedding has jumped into the Top Gear Racing Volvo. That is the second of the Volvos. We weren't expecting to see that. It is a Lewis Simsport satellite team. He's going to start from rear of grid. Now, normally he has got a Ford to pilot, but he's decided to jump aboard and start rear of grid. So let's keep an eye out for this one here, Hans. This could be interesting seeing what Lewis can do from ROG. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it, it's probably not going to see the arse end of the world, but he, I mean, he's not at the arse end of the world, but he can see it from there. So uh, let's see how far up the field he can go. Uh, it's a pretty good operator, that Lewis Wedding, so uh, we'll keep an eye on him tonight. Just notice Stenberg's a little bit far forward in the box, but 90 days ago we finished the season, and now we get a version from the reigning champ gets out in front. Everything looks pretty clean back there. Termo's harassing the back of a couple of the HDS cars on the run down to turn four. And in fact, no, he hasn't got it. And it's been contact already between Pete Savage, Zach Ross, Termo's around. A couple of the cars have managed to get through, but so far it looks like everybody, bar the little bit of contact, has gotten through and gotten away cleanly. Lewis Wedding's had a great start, but we go back to see what's happened on earth happened to Termo. He's so he's pulled up and burko has gone into the back of him, so Burko had nowhere to go. But uh, Zach Ross, he was very lucky to actually get righted in that. He didn't actually spin around, so he's still going, Zach Ross. But Termo, unfortunately, he's actually uh, come off uh, second best here. Yeah, that's usually disappointing. You're right. He just checked up to avoid the contact ahead. And unfortunately for him, he got rear-ended by Steve Burke. And that's going to be probably deemed a racing incident too. There won't, there'll won't. be some pretty furious comments going on right now in the garage. Uh, pit crew members for... Lou Simsport with two cars coming into contact so early in the race. Lap one in the books. And we've got a nice little breakaway already. Just the PBF of Brenton Foley, the 47 of Kurt Stenberg, and then Will Devonish is number 15 hanging on here as well. And there's a move on being made down the back here. And this is Scott Nolan down the inside of Mitch Hathaway. And that's a wonderful move out of turn number one. Lined that up beautifully, carried a lot of speed and fantastic pass textbook move into turn four Steve that's where they really start to sort themselves out for the next section the staircase section series of 90 degree corners but it looks like Hathaway had a bit of a run there but he just pulled the nose back in and just stayed behind Scotty Nolan there in the Synergy Sim Racing Commodore so uh, Hathaway maybe not quite as much speed he tried to fight him but he's at to, he's actually dropped back now so poor exit out of the uh, turn seven into turn eight now so Scott Nolan got a bit of speed on board and it's only the second lap of 78. Yeah, Scott Nolan's a very experienced campaigner. We've seen him race in a couple of different series in Automobilista Australia over the last two years. Good to have him back aboard Supercars for 2020. Of course, very, very famous name that you probably will have seen out there in the sim racing world, also in AMS Oz of Brenton Hobson, also out of the Synergy Sim Racing Stable. We've seen them time and time again. As he makes a little bit of a mistake there, Scott Nolan, a little bit tail happy out of the final corner. So that's just given a little bit of a carrot there to Mitch Hathaway, but he hasn't been able to capitalise on the mistake from Nolan. How's the run go through the opening chicane? And no, he's probably a bit too far back to challenge here. Scott's very, very much awake to what's going on at the moment and holds position for the moment. Ranging up onto the back of them is Pete Savage and then Zach Ross is a bit further behind. So at the moment, HDS and Lou Simsport running four, five, sorry, uh, five, six, seven, and eight on the road at the moment. So we've got four Commodores and then four Falcons. I wouldn't want any of those uh, Lou Simsport cars that punt each other off because it wouldn't be a good idea. Lewis Wedding, incidentally, he started from the back of the grid three laps into the race, or on the third lap of the race. He's up to ninth place, so pretty impressive. Not all of him uh, passing cars. There was a bit of accidents happening in front of him. Oh, a bit messy down at turn nine. I just saw up there. Did someone get spilled? Oh, we'll see. 
But uh, maybe not. We might see it later on. But Lewis Wedding, pretty impressive performance. He's managed to get ahead of the Mercedes of uh, Blake Tilbrook there, the sole uh, representative for Mercedes in this category. And uh, now we're up to two Volvos, funnily enough. So Jono, Jono S, he's actually not in the car. It's, uh, here we go, a move for position. Will Devonish, he's got a better run, and Foley's out in the grass, and he nearly went pitch, pitch first into the wall there. But uh, Foley he needs to get it back uh, into position. And Foley's actually down in third now, so a bit of a shocking run for Foley. That promotes Stenberg up into the lead, Devonish, then back to Foley. So Foley, he had the really good start. He managed to convert it away with no wheel spin. But uh, Stenberg, massive black lines of wheel spin coming off the start line, and he lost position into turn one. But seems to be able to have more pace and able to drive the car harder and more consistently, Steve. Yeah, it certainly looks that way. In actual fact, that might have been the mess that you saw happening down at turn nine while we were watching the, uh, the HDS car of Hathaway and the JK Science car of Scott Nolan going through turn eight with the helicopter shot, you just caught the little bit of mess that was going on at turn nine. Perhaps that was this, that was Kurt Stenberg sneaking down the inside of Brenton Foley at turn nine. And then it was decided that by uh, Will Devonish that he wanted to get a piece of that as well. And he has right now. So Stenberg's just eked out a 1.3 second advantage at the moment. We're just keeping an eye on the sector times at the moment. He is about three tenths of a second quicker than Will Devonish overall this lap and the run to the line will tell us what the times are. We probably expect to see a new fastest lap, and there it is from Kurt Stenberg at 18.755. New fastest lap of the race, three whole tenths quicker than Will Devonish. In actual fact, Devonish was a fraction quicker in the final sector. And here we go, it's on behind as well. The HDS car of Hathaway is now under pressure from Pete Savage. And these are teammate cars, or a teammate car and a satellite car, depending on how you want to call it. They're out of the same shed, but it is now on between the uh, the four teammates here. Yeah, I think Zach Bross has dropped off this pack as well, and I did. I was just looking at um, sorry uh, Lewis Wedding's car, and I actually heard a bit of uh, brake squealing and tyre locking in the background. So Zach Bross has had a bit of an off at the centre chicane, but Mitch Hathaway is coming under. Friendly fire almost from uh, Peter Savage, who's actually set the new fastest lap of the race on the last lap by. So he was about a tenth quicker than uh, our lead car, Kurt Stenberg. So he's got a heap of pace on board. And uh, Brent Foley, he looks like he might be vulnerable to Scott Nolan here because Scott Nolan is catching him hand over fist. Oh, Hathaway, he nearly had to, he had to get out of that because he nearly went into the tyre barrier there and that would have knocked him into the concrete wall. But... Pete Savage, he's actually a pretty good performer. He didn't get the most that he wanted out of the shootout, but now he's trying to bring some redemption back. He couldn't make any positions up in the shootout, but let's see what he can... And a bit of a yellow flag zone up here, so let's see what's going on. I'm wondering if that's potentially for... Yeah, yeah Billy Dougal Salonga. So that's... Uh, that's be, oh, sorry, Zach Ross. There you go. So that was Zach Ross. What on earth happened to Zach Ross there? He's uh, Something's happened to him. Let's see if we can pick up on the replay what happened there. So, so no, we just got Steve, that would have happened... So, uh, Steve, that would have happened on the last lap by. So, and, uh, oh, that's a very dangerous position to be parked on track. I think he's actually had some sort of lag issue with his computer hardware issue because uh, very unusual for Zach Ross to just leave the car on track like that. Meanwhile, Kurt Stenberg, he's consolidating his lead right now. Two and a quarter seconds over Will Devonish, and Will Devonish, he's pushing hard. So too Brent Foley, but Brent Foley can't really make any inroads. Neither can Will Devonish and uh, Kurt Stenberg. He's showing shades of form that we've seen him in the past. And Hathaway again, under attack from Pete Savage. And uh, Brute is his nickname in the Discord. And uh, he's being a bit of a brute now. He's trying to assault and harass the back of Mitch Hathaway. Fantastic driving. But uh, the gap has opened up a little bit just through this turn 12, 13, 14 section. Just the last sector at the Adelaide Parkland circuit. And Mitch Hathaway, he's actually uh, got a bit of a buffer now, so it's not looking so bad for him. He's not quite under attack from uh, Pete Savage anymore. No, and Billy Dougal Salonga was in this battle as well. It was four forwards, line astern, and now we're down to just this pair as well. And BDS has gone down to 13th. I'm wondering if he had a bit of a moment somewhere as well, maybe potentially caught up with what happened to, to Zach Ross as well as a result of why he's a bit further down the order. And it looks like Glenn Miles may have already taken a stop very, very early for a pit stop. He's already gone a lap down, which is not something you tend to see this early 
in a race, only seven laps in. We're just starting to settle down a little bit at the moment. There's plenty of gaps, plenty of air between all these cars. They've just got to maybe just get into a bit of a rhythm and get to this first pit stop window. Meanwhile, you're having a bit of a look back here at the, uh, the Lewis Wedding Mobile here, uh, Hans, <laughs> and he's on the back of Blake Tilbrook's Mercedes. Yeah, Blake Tilbrook, he's actually keeping up with uh, Lewis Wedding there, but Lewis Wedding, he went for a dive down the inside at Turn 4, and he actually uh, ended up uh, running wide at Turn 4, so that gave the position back to Blake Tilbrook. And uh, Blake, he's actually doing a pretty reasonable job. He managed to stay on the back of the uh, Lewis Simsport uh, satellite car as he makes a bit of a mistake coming into Turn 11 there. But uh, one of the Scuderia Alitalia, I, I should say the sole uh, Scuderia Alitalia car tonight, Glenn Miles, after taking his stop, he's actually uh, went into the wall at Turn 8 and he went back into the uh, other side of the road. So he came from the outside wall back to the inside wall, a bit like a pinball. So not uh, ideal for Glenn Miles, but uh, let's see if his strategy might actually help him later on in the night. Blake Tilbrook, reasonable effort, and Merck, he's actually pretty happy with it because, I mean, he should be pretty happy because he was keeping up with uh, Lewis Wedding. Loose in the Volvo. We're accustomed to seeing Lewis Wedding in a Ford Falcon FGX, but now he's flying the flag for the satellite team in the Volvo, the Razor Volvo. Yeah, taking the Volvo on from Jono, who will be the pilot of that Volvo normally when it comes uh, hopefully a bit later on in the year. I'm not sure what stage he'll be taking that on, but another driver to come aboard. And we've got a safety car. So we've had our first safety car has been called for on lap number eight. Now we're going to have to try and figure out what this is all for. Billy Dougal Salong are moving a bit slowly. Glenn Miles looks like he's okay. So I dare say it's a Billy Dougal Salong thing. And the pit stop activity has already started. Now Scott Nolan had grabbed Brenton Foley prior to the safety car as well. So top four all in. And Pete Savage stays out, like so too does Mitch Hathaway. Okay, so this is where everything starts to change a little bit here. We're going to have to keep an eye on where everybody's at. Mitch Hathaway goes through. So too does the, the Volvo of Steve Burko. And Kurt Stenberg's 47 is on the move in pit lane. So too Devonish Foley. And Scott Nolan has been jumped, has been re-jumped by Brenton Foley in the pit lane. So... Very, very quick bit of strategy there. And Lewis Wedding goes through behind Stenberg. So this has really mixed this order up. Now, I dare say whatever happened, it probably happened for Billy Dougal Slonger. He is the, the second to was the second to last man there. He's probably gone around and triggered the safety car in a, in a bit of a point. So we haven't got any vision as to what happened there, although Hans is having a bit of a look through to see if he can figure that out. But two-thirds of the field have taken service here. So this is... Very, very interesting. And we're getting confirmation through from the Loose Simsport stable that is indeed a PC crash for Zach Ross. So that's a little bit disappointing that he didn't uh, he didn't have more luck with the machine over there. So out of all this, only the one retirement so far, but the HSV Camaro safety car is out on circuit. And three drivers did not stop in that particular stanza and that is the top three so that is pete savage mitch hathaway and steve burko now we have to start talking a little bit about pit stop strategy in a minute hans but before we do what do you make of this the wise idea not to stop you think it's too early now i would never discount um mitch hathaway because he has history in being successful at the adelaide circuit he won the opening race of last season that was when it was a 175 kilometer event so and peter savage he's got a whole lot of speed on board the fgx and he's been picked up with loose sim sport um i would say it's a bit of a surprise packet at the moment because we don't know what their fuel mileage is like we don't know what their tire life is like and potentially I mean, it, it makes a bit of an inconvenience for Kurt Stenberg because he has to uh, try and get past them, or he can wait. Now, it is even more con inconvenient for Scotty Nolan, who's actually fallen behind uh, Brenton Foley after the pit stops, and Brenton Foley, the PBF crew, has managed to send him out before that, and Scott Nolan having to yield after being released, but Scott Nolan, he's actually have to going, uh, he has to go and do all that work all over again, so uh, good on Brenton Foley for managing to get back up there, but I guess uh, for Scott Nolan, it's a bit of a frustration because he got past him on the track and the pit stop strategy didn't work out for him. We're just looking at the last cars to come up onto the train now. Glenn Miles and, uh, oh, problem for Blake Tilbrook potentially? Or did he come in? No, he may have come in actually. 
So he's come in uh, just after lining up from the safety car, so it gives him a bit of clear air, but he needs to catch up on the end of this pack. And uh, this all works out for Lewis Wedding pretty well because if the uh, the field is compressed and he's right now in sixth position, so on corrected order, first three cars take their stop. At, uh, Lewis Wedding he jumps up into third, so really impressive uh, opening stanza from Lewis Wedding. I'm impressed with that. But uh, let's see what the I reckon now. Sorry, I'm just looking at Termo here. I thought I thought yeah, he didn't get. Uh, no, Termo's got, got this as a free kick actually as well because he was the the one that lost out in that very early contact at turn four. So this has really brought him back into play here. Lewis Wedding was one of the other cars that did not stop. So there, well, I said that there were three. There was actually four. Wedding was the fourth. And it looks like most of the cars are going to get back onto the back of this train. The only one I think is still coming along to the back of it is Blake Tilbrook. So are we going to get a safety car? coming in this time are we going to go around again we're going around again here we go again around around the Adelaide Street Circuit behind the HSV Camaro safety car but uh, new experience for Peter actually I don't think he's actually restarted a race from uh, the front position Stephen shakes his head he confirms my uh, knowledge on that so uh, we'll see what that's like there's a very specific restart procedure and no passing before the control light either. So, uh, no, not even overlap, I believe. That is precisely correct. The, the procedure is that the safety car will go in, green flag will be shown, and the race leader goes when they get to the control line. So they need to stay line astern until that point. We've got some stats in here about the, the pit lane and the time that it takes to fill these cars up. It's a little bit slower compared to refueling for last year. But the stint length based on green flag running, we worked out to be about, it's about five litres a lap, getting to about 21 to 22 laps per stint. Of course, the opening stint did have the warm-up lap in there as well, the formation lap. So some of these drivers that have come in at the end of lap eight have actually got to save a fair bit of fuel here because they're going to be tight to try and make it work on this strategy. If you're running a green flag stint, so you're going to be working on a three-stop strategy in critical lap, trying to work getting back, which is going to be lap between lap 56 and 58, which is still uh, close to 20 laps shy of the end of the... You have to sort of have a last-minute run there, but they're still going to be a little bit short on fuel here, and they're going to have to stop again. So the only real benefit they've got here is they've... The car's from fourth on back, with the exception of Lewis Wedding in sixth place, is that they've got fresh rubber and that they're going to be off sequence to everybody else. Yeah, I'm wondering if Lewis Wedding, he may have done something wrong by staying out because although he gets track position, but yeah, it depends how much pace he's got on board compared to new tyres. So his pace wasn't terrible, but let's see how long he can make those tyres last. Same two goes for uh, Burko, Hathaway and Peter Savage, and we're just about to go racing because the safety car has pulled in, and we will be awaiting the green flag and the control line. And uh, Savage ready. has gone early, so he's gone early here. I think that's going to be a penalty potentially. That might be a bit of an issue, Steve. Might be looked at after the race. I was aware that this had happened last year with uh, JP Curie as well, going a little bit too early. But depending on what's been noted in the briefing, here goes Kurt Stenberg. Oh, look at this, a bit of contact. Here's Stenberg into Burko. I didn't think Burko knew he was there, and Devonish tried to go with him, and Lewis Wedding's got absolutely nowhere to go. Burko defending like his life depends on it. Stenberg trying to make the move stick. They just avoided a bit of a catastrophe there as Burko goes sailing over the turn six curve, but Stenberg follows him as well, trying to get the draft. Is he got to, he's got to be ahead of the 150 more board here. And I think you'll find that Stenberg actually is. So he's going to get that move done finally. Devonish is going to stay tucked in behind the number seven for the moment. Oh, Burko got the wall. Burko got the inside wall at turn eight. And then that was the 99 car behind them, the BDS getting the wall on the outside. So now Burko's left high and dry, wetting up the inside of Will Devonish. That's not going to go very well. Foley going round the outside. Burko's like a, like a pinball at the minute. He's just ricocheting off absolutely everybody. And now Scott Nolan's the next man in the queue to get through the number seven Volvo. Is he going to get the job done at the final corner? The answer is yes. Decisive move gets it done. Demotes Burko back to P8. Jeez, that was a bit of a wild restart, wasn't it? That was very wild and willing. And it's only lap 
13 now of a 78 lap race, it's like it looks like a bloody sprint race, Steve. Just uh, everyone's uh, getting very wild and willing and uh, leaning on each other at this early stage. Now, I'm worried about Will Devonish. Did he take on board damage from uh, the ricocheting Burko Volvo? So I'm worried about that. So maybe it's not looking ideal for him. But Will Devonish, he was a chance to get up on Will, uh, sorry, not Will, uh, Kurt Stenberg. Will Devonish on Kurt Stenberg. That was going to happen, but then he couldn't get a good run out of the staircase section. But look at Lewis Wedding. It looks like he's got a bit of a tactical masterstroke, but he is one stop behind. So he needs to take a stop in the near future, potentially. Yeah, as we said, looking at the figures for how it's going to pan out for a three-stop race, you'll be stopping around lap 21 to 22 if you're running green flag oh, running. Oh, moving to turn up. Oh, here it is. Foley get, get it all locked up, gets backs out of it. But given they've had a couple of laps under safety car, that's going to extend the pit window for Lewis Wedding, so you can probably make it up to about lap 23, 24, 25. So he's going to have a little bit more time up his sleeve, which means he's going to have a shorter stop at the end of the race compared relative to everybody else. Even though these other car, they thought all the cars are on the same strategy as him. All the other cars, such as your Peter, your Kurt Stenberg, uh, and sorry, Kurt Stenberg, your Brenton Foley, those guys are all going to be pitting again, probably around about the lap 30 to 32 mark, just depending on how things work out. So a little bit of a, about 10 laps off sequence to everybody else. New fastest lap for Kurt Stenberg. He's now picked off Mitch Hathaway as well and he's setting his sights on the back of Peter, but Hathaway's not letting Stenberg get away here, so that was an opportunistic move. Stenberg's just trying to clear this forward pair. He's in the middle of a sandwich at the minute. Will Devon is just starting to try and make a little bit of tracks here as we watch from the, the multiple helicopter angles. Now, Stenberg's not gonna be close enough to have a go here into turn eight. He shows the nose, tucks back in, gets a nice line, runs it right out to the fence, and this is where you wanna be really, really brave on the anchors here. And he gets it stopped and gets it turned in beautifully, but just gets a little bit of a moment on the exit there. And Will Devonish slipped through on the inside of Mitch Hathaway as well. So good move in the background for Will Devonish, not trying to let Stenberg get away. So potentially not taking a stop has hurt these guys up the front, but it's not going to hurt Lewis Wedding. Because he started at the back of the field, he can actually take an opportunity like that and run out of sequence. If you are Brenton Foley and Will Devonish and Kurt Stenberg pits, you are locked into the same strategy. You have to try and beat him on the same strategy and try and uh, take him one-on-one -on, -one on the racetrack. So, I mean, Kurt Stenberg, very forceful driving on this restart, and he's using every millimetre of road. Fantastic driving from uh, Kurt Stenberg. Number 47 TTR machine. ZB Commodore flying the flag for the ZB Opal. But, uh, and Steve gets a bit of a laugh out of that one. I, I wanted to see if he was listening. He was. You're an open driver, uh, so I know exactly where that's coming from. They're rubbish cars, aren't they? No, I never said that. No, we're not We're not here to review cars. We're just here to look at these cars that are essentially the same underneath. A lot of curb there for Peter Savage. He went all the way over the curb. The car was bouncing uh, left and right. And uh, Will Devonish, he's got Peter Savage in his crosshairs at the moment. But Peter Savage's pace has actually come on strong a little bit compared to Devonish. So... He might be able to stick, he might be able to, uh, as I say that, he goes for a big move, he just gets it stopped. Hathaway, he uh, followed him, he thought, oh, you're breaking at that point, I can break too. And uh, obviously, uh, very close to a concertina type accident there. But they all live to fight another day. Incidentally, uh, Scotty Nolan, he's gotten past Foley again. Sorry, I, I make a mistake. Uh, where is Foley? Here's a will move for Will Devonish down the inside of Pete Savage. That was being lined up all the way back at turn nine. He made a good follow out of turn nine and stayed with it. So Foley is now still in front of Scott Nolan for the moment. Scott Nolan's just Apologies, dropped back a little uh, bit. That's Lewis Wedding. I thought that was Scott Nolan for a second. They look similar. Yeah, uh, distance they look a little bit similar in terms of the car livery. You're absolutely right. So Lewis Wedding's still holding his own com relative to these guys here that did not stop. So Pete Savage and Mitch Hathaway. And then Lewis Wedding has actually closed in on this pair relative to the pace that these guys are doing. So look at the laps that they're actually doing. Actual fact, Peter registered a track cut on the previous lap as well. So that didn't work in his favor, but we're, Peter and Hathaway are doing minute twenties. Uh, Lewis Wedding's last lap was a 19.626. In actual fact, was his best lap of the race. So still making those tires work really, really well. Stenberg's wasted. Oh, Foley in the wall. Sorry, Steve. Uh, Foley got a bit of the wall there. So, uh, Let's see how much damage he's picked up there because it was actually quite a hard hit. The car jostled back and forth. So we're just watching this run coming out of turn seven now. 
we'll be able to see Steve if he actually managed to get the inside wall and that maybe put the car offline. So here he goes through turn eight. Oh, it gets the wall just at the very late part of it. Scotty Nolan was close to going in as well. He actually was on the uh, lock stops there trying to keep it out of the wall. So uh, good drive for Scotty Nolan not to go in and maybe he's looking at uh, Brent Foley. He's just like, hey, maybe I can make an opportunity out of this if he's hitting balls. Yeah, you certainly don't want to be doing that for too much longer. Uh, Pancake in the wall like that's not too terrible. You sort of hit that at the precisely the right angle to avoid too much damage. But you don't want to... Visually, there's no damage on the car, so it's not looking too bad for Foley's D. No, it looks pretty straight. At the moment, Scott Nolan off turn five there as well. Foley's doing pretty well to hang with Lewis Wedding here. Their lap time's actually pretty similar last time around. Foley was actually two tenths quicker, 19.2 to a 19.4. Coincidentally, Kurt Stenberg's wasted no time getting into the 17s. The 17.589 is the, now the new fastest lap of this race a couple of laps ago. Foley gets the wall again. And Stenberg's 15, sorry, 17.293 is the lap record. In actual fact, uh, for qualifying, that actual fact, the 17.589 is actually now a new race lap record as well. So it takes the marker away from Brennan Ross from last year's Super 2 Championship, which was in the 18s. So record book's being rewritten already this year. And now Foley starts to interrogate the rear of the Volvo to come out of the final corner. Just loses a little bit of touch. That's where Foley got let down in the shootout last week, Hans. He had a bit of, he was actually looking really, really good through the first two sectors to post a really respectable time and lost all of it in the final sector. In actual fact, lost all of it in the final corner. Yeah, 100%. Oh, Lewis Wedding runs wide here, and that gives Foley the opportunity. A bit of hip and shoulder. Thank you very much, he says. But uh, Foley managed to get past now. But, uh, oh, Lewis Wedding, he's going to go on the inside. Oh, he had to back out of that at the very last moment. Otherwise, there was going to definitely be an accident there. There was going to be a collision. But uh, you're right, Steve. Brent and Foley, he's had a, a lot of trouble in the final sector. And a lot of cars actually had trouble in the final sector. They're all steering wide at turn 14. And it ended up that he went up over the kerb and ended up on the dirt, so he got a very poor run running to the finish line, but otherwise... Yeah, otherwise his pace was pretty good throughout that qualifying lap. In actual fact, there's been quite a number of drivers that early on last week struggled pulling it up at the hairpin at turn 14, which you saw on the highlights package a little bit earlier, as we've lost our second car from the racing Glenn Miles uh, just a lap or two ago. Yeah, see, look, already smoking all the way here. Foley does it too, locks it up. Likewise, ahead of Foley, Pete Savage locked it up as well, going into turn 14. There's a few cars that have been doing that tonight as well. I even saw Kurt Stenberg on the lock stops there as well. Completely missed the apex in the early running in the first few laps at turn 14 as well. So not the only one making mistakes, but everybody pushing very, very hard. And, and essentially, it's, a, it's an endurance race. It's 250 kilometers. And these guys are already treating it, or in the early going, we're treating it like it was a sprint. You're absolutely spot on the money. The, the kind of racing that we were seeing was a testament to what we've seen. We're going to see in places like Winton and, and that later on in the year. Yeah, you're absolutely right there, Steve. I think, uh, I think they're just pushing a little bit too hard. They're trying to get the most out of the tyre, be fully grip limited, but they're just trail braking a bit too much. And that obviously, <laughs> if you don't trail brake, you steer wide. And if you do trail brake a bit too much, you do steer wide. You need to be able to put enough load on the nose without uh, getting front locking. Here we go, a bit of a move. Scott Nolan on Lewis Wedding. Oh, Lewis Wedding, shocking run out of there. And uh, he just got up on that curve, gassed it up, and the uh, Volvo didn't go anywhere. So uh, Lewis Wedding running the Top Gear Racing Razor Volvo, satellite operation for Loose Simsport. You can see the decal on the front bar. And uh, hopefully we'll see Jono later on this season take up his rightful place in the car. But uh, Lewis Wedding, uh, I think those tyres are looking pretty second-hand now, so he's... Uh, no, nothing lost, nothing gained, I guess, for Lewis Wedding, because he's running just about where he was just before the safety car came out. Yeah, he's, I think the, the newer tyres are starting to show their extra potential here. So, of course, the tyres on the likes of Scott Knoll and Kurt Stenberg, Will Devonish, Brett Foley, they're all eight laps newer. 
than what's currently on the Volvo and the two HDS cars a bit further up the, uh, the field, or the other listings cars, I should say, as well. Granted, they've had time to cool those tyres down and preserve them a little bit to keep as much in check as they possibly can, but the problem they now have is that the performance is being outgained. As Brent Foley now has a look down the inside of Pete Savage, number 88, gets it done, turn nine, job done. Beautiful move, Brent Foley, up to P4. Peter Savage just led him through there, so the tyre's probably not looking good on his car as well. Oh, Brent Foley's just steered wide into the tyre wall, so he might be a chance to lose this position, but this brings Scott Nolan up to the back of Pete Savage, and he makes the pass at turn 13, and uh, he's going to get it done at down at 14. Or is it? Is he going to get it done? Pete Savage hangs tough, but he's going to have to yield, or not. Maybe not. It's going on for a while, so he's going to go get our jail free card for Brenton Foley, because... And now Scott Nolan gets a position, so Peter yields. And then uh, now that puts uh, Lewis Wedding onto the back of Pete Savage. Lewis Wedding, I guess he thinks the Red Sea has opened up for him because these uh, three guys in front of him, they're actually tearing each other apart and uh, trying to get the World Championship of 21 lap races at Adelaide. So uh, I guess they're driving like it's the last lap, but not realizing that, yes, there is quite a way to go. And uh, Kurt Stenberg, he's actually running away with this at the moment. The gap, incidentally, to, between Stenberg and Devonish has stabilised to about five seconds. So it's actually closed up for about six seconds of previous couple of laps. Yeah, ahead Devonish is starting to slowly pick off uh, the lap times with regards to Kurt Stenberg. The last couple of laps, uh, he's been reeling him in at the moment. This lap he's tracking like he's, he's going to lose a little bit of time. There's a bit of a free kick to Brenton Foley here, as you said. He's... Scott Nolan's now managed to get the job done on Pete Savage. I was about to say, for a little while, it looked like Foley really wasn't making any real inroads into Pete Savage and Mitch Hathaway uh, being on the new attire. But it slowly started to come back to him. And Mitch Hathaway is actually a couple of seconds up the road from Brent Foley. Let's see if we can get a bit of a glance as to what Hathaway's doing. So he's down here at turn four, actually behind uh, his teammate, Billy Dougal Salonga. Now, who can remember back to last year, the coming together of teammates at Phillip Island around the final corner and uh, what happened in that particular household when that happened. The two, the two boys actually lived, were living together at that stage and they ran into each other. Apparently they didn't speak to each other for a half an hour after that all happened. So would you love to have been a fly on the wall when that happened? I don't think I would like to be a fly on the wall. I think <laughs> I would hear a few, a few bleating expletives happening there Steve uh, over the dinner table but I reckon I don't think it was actually anyone's fault there because it just so happened that uh, uh, Billy Dougal Salonga was the car that went over and we don't usually see these cars go over on their head but when they do it's always a, a bit of a disaster and then just to add insult to injury Hathaway came around the corner and bang and uh, look I don't think that's uh, I don't think it's fair to hold it against him but you know these things happen I think they were just a bit uh, uh, disappointed in it that it happened to be his car that he hit. And here we go, uh, Mitch Hathaway is into the pits. Under green flag running as well. Yeah, so this is about where you would normally expect to get to if you were full green flag running for your first stop. So this is actually slightly earlier than I thought we'd be seeing Mitch Hathaway in. I did say he's probably going to be in around 23, 24, 25. This is slightly ahead of schedule because they did have some safety car intervention in the first stint. So if that's the kind of fuel mileage that Hathaway's been pulling, when we don't expect to, we expect to see Lewis Wedding and Pete Savage in the next couple of laps, if that's what it's to be judged on. Just keeping an eye on things as well. For a little while, Will Devonish was starting to reel in the lap times against Kurt Stenberg. Kurt has now responded and pumped in a pair of 18s to Devonish's 19s and restored that advantage out to over five seconds now. So it was coming down a little bit, whether Kurt's just managing the tyres a little bit more or whether Will's just applying a little bit of pressure, but Will did have a bit of a shocking lap in there at one stage. In actual fact, uh, his lap times have now started to drop back more into the 19s, which is where we really started to see the pace in, in practice ahead of tonight's race. Most of the lap times were high 18s, low 19s, race trim. Lewis Wedding gets past Pete Savage, so that's a... A very easy pass and Pete Savage comes in so that's the question answered so the two Falcons are in and Lewis Wedding goes through to P5 see if he can get maybe another lap or two before coming in 
at least extending that strategy just a little bit more. And then we start to get to these couple of guys, the top four that all came in on the first safety car intervention on lap at the end of lap eight. We expect to be going into the early 30s before we start to see them come in. Bit of a lock break by Foley there. He's pushing hard. He's trying to keep Scott Nolan behind him. Uh, I heard a bit of a crash on the wall. I think Kurt Stenberg might have gone into the wall here or maybe a lap car. I'm not sure. But uh, we'll get to the bottom of that eventually. Yeah, just keeping an eye on the times there to see what the sector times are like. See if it was Stenberg or what happened ahead. There's actually a lap car ahead, the 13th place car of Billy Dougal Salonga as Scott Nolan gets the move done on Brent Foley for the second time at turn nine. Now I think it probably would have been the car of Billy Dougal Salonga just between uh, Will Devonish and Scott Nolan that actually went through and must have scraped that wall there. Brenton Foley is just about to uh, end up on the grass and nearly spun around. He nearly rotated the thing. Lucky he didn't go lose more uh, time to Scott Nolan than he did. Scott Nolan is probably thinking deja vu. I've seen the back of this car before. Hang on a minute. But now he's passed again. And we're looking at this moment for Brenton Foley. And coming into turn 14, the entry. Oh, he gets out on the grass there and he steers well wide of the ideal line. So not looking good for Brenton Foley at this stage. And as we say that, he's right on the back of Scotty Nolan again. So a bit of a tardy run through the first sector for Scott Nolan. And Foley's back on his tail again, harassing the back of the ZB Commodore. Here's some uh, more stoppers. So Steve Burko was another one of the drivers that did not stop on the previous run. So he's in. Termo has come in as well. So this is a bit strange as well. Termo is actually, was one of the cars that actually... Did he stop? I can't recall whether or not Termo stopped under the last safety car. I believe car. Termo stopped. I believe he stopped under the safety car because he didn't make any uh, ground on anyone. So I believe he just held station there while he stopped. So he's probably coming in so to try in and early. cover off. So he's trying to come in and cover off a few people potentially or maybe go for an undercut somewhere along the line. He's actually now gone a lap down. So that's cost him a little bit. He was right in the thick of things. He's actually come out between... Uh, Will Devonish and who's that? Uh, Billy Dougal Salonga. So in actual fact, he's ahead of Billy Dougal Salonga. So I think maybe that's why he came in, realising BDS was on the quicker tyre, having come in to make a stop. In actual fact, BDS has wrestled that position away from Termo. So it hasn't worked out for Termo on this occasion. Uh, reacting a little bit too late to the 99 of Dougal Salonga coming in. And it looks like you've seen a move up here. It looks like Foley's got the job done. He's gotten back past Scott Nolan, Hans. Yeah, Scott Nolan, he hit the wall on the exit of Turn 4, and uh, that gave the opportunity to Foley to make it stick. And here we go. You'll see Scott Nolan. He just goes a bit wide, steers well wide of the apex into the tyre barrier. Oh, not quite, but he managed to keep it out. And he's trying to defend hard here. Foley, he's just got a bit more pace. He had a better run, and uh, Scotty Nolan's going to have to yield. And again, he gets to see the back of the number one PBF race engineering Commodore. And uh, I think he's probably getting a bit sick of it. Yeah, I think he is. Brenton Foley's really throwing down, being, or being challenged and throwing down a challenge at the same time with Scott Nolan. So this is a really good race-long battle that we've seen already. And Scott Nolan, very late decision by Scott Nolan to come into the pits. And, he really, and he's, he's made a mistake. He's in the wall. He's done the Russell Engel yeah, 2003. He's made a huge mistake there. Let's go and have a look at that on the replay because that's a very, very big move. He, Burton Foley made a lock up here. Now, Scott Nolan's probably playing the long game here, trying to think about, you know, when everybody's due to come in and take some service. Have a look at this for a late minute decision. Very, very super late on the brakes there. And in actual fact, we're going for the wrong camera there, but uh, yeah, makes a right hash of that and eventually gets it going again. I think you have to pluck reverse there. So not an ideal run for Scott Nolan. He'll be hoping for a safety car later on to erase that miscue because that would have cost him about five or six seconds. And uh, we're just looking at Blake Tilbrook now. He's just just gently chipping away at it. And he's firmly up into the top ten now in fifth place. I like the strategy Blake Tilbrook's going for at the moment. I mean, he's, he hasn't got the pace to run with the front runners at the minute. So he's just come in when the safety car was in, topped off the fuel. He's come, now he's probably going to run this tank all the way down and just see where everything happens. Now, 
We're just keeping an eye on the back of shot here. You're looking at something with regards to Lewis Wedding here. Uh, Hans, what have you seen? Yeah, Lewis Wedding just went into the pits on the 26th lap, 27th lap he's come out. So uh, back out again for Lewis Wedding, off he runs. So we'll go back to this little battle here. So Cam Rutledge has actually come out, is ahead of Scott Nolan. So Scott Nolan's come in behind his fellow ZB Commodore driver in Cam Rutledge. So the electrician is got the blinkers on at the moment. Just void argument. And pretty brave through. to do that. Yeah, it came from a long way back. That's just, the, I guess, the confidence in, you know, between different drivers in the same type of machinery as well. I guess because Scotty Nolan's playing the long game, I guess it's because he wants to get past Cam Rutledge as soon as he can so he doesn't waste uh, too much time uh, compared to Stenberg and Devonish and the like because uh, every lap he spends behind a slower car, he's actually giving up time. So he's not not down and out, but uh, he's down the order in seventh. But we'll see if another late safety car or some sort of event may bring him back into the race. Keeping an eye on proceedings at the front as well. So Brenton Foley, third place. Will Devonish is still trying to make some inroads into Kurt Stenberg here. And just slowly starting to stabilise this gap and start to track toward the number 47. Lap times last time around were actually pretty similar. It was Stenberg's 119.001, Devonish 119.083, so not a lot in it at all. So Stenberg's just eked out two tenths in the first sector on this particular lap, or a, sector, or a tenth and a half rather. And the number 47 is now starting to come up to some lap traffic. Actually, he's starting to come up to the back of Lewis Wedding, who has stopped for the second time. Kurt Stenberg, of course, has not stopped for the second time just yet. We expect him in probably in the next couple of laps. The gap's still stable at about seven seconds now. Next, in fact, Will Devonish took out four tenths out of Stenberg on that particular sector as well. So trading some sector times here. Now, if I was Kurt Stenberg, if I'm going to be caught up behind a very, very quick Lewis Wedding for a little bit, I'd be thinking about coming in in the next lap or two and just allowing and then forcing the hand of the others behind. What do you reckon, Hans? Yeah, I reckon that's a good move because although Lewis Wedding's quick, Kurt Stenberg is quicker. However, Lewis Wedding is quick enough to hold his position. So uh, he's perfectly entitled to, but, uh, you know, especially to prevent himself from going a lap down and... We're seeing the wrench on the bottom left hand of the screen, so that means Stenberg will be coming in in the near future, whether it's in the next lap or two laps, we're not sure. But uh, Kurt Stenberg. Oh, Lewis Wedding, he makes a mistake. He's going to go a lap down here. Disastrous for Lewis Wedding. But it might come back to him later on uh, when Stenberg pits. So Lewis just needs to hold station here. Just say, here we go, a penalty for Steve Burko. That may be a pit lane penalty. Uh, pit lane speeding infringement? No, that actually looks like it's a track violation. Doesn't look like he's actually in the pits at the minute. He's actually just come out of turn uh, turn seven. So he is been pinged for some track violations. Probably went over the curbs a little bit too aggressively, I would say, down at uh, at turn six or maybe even at turn three. And Stenberg is in. So Lewis Wedding will get that lap back. He'll remain on the lead lap. Nice tight turning radius for the number 47. Does Devonish react? Devonish no. stays out. He stays out. So Stenberg, he went for the late move again into the pit lane. And uh, Devonish, he will come across to lead this race. And uh, Foley Brent going... Foley might be a chance to get past him as well. Yeah, Foley's going through as well. Burko's just coming in to serve the penalty. So that's good news for Foley because he was next in the queue to be uh, passed by Brenton Foley. So that's a bit of a free kick there. And of course, Scott Nolan... Uh, actually, D2's moved up into fourth place, but we, he looks like he's coming in this lap as well. That'll put Mitch Hathaway back into the top five when D2 comes in to take service. Now, Hathaway has already been into the lane. Here comes the, the Bundaberg number 55. Brendan Ross, his teammate, unfortunately not racing this week. Another one of the victims of daylight savings change. And, of course, there's another car yet to come out of the, the PBF satellite team's stable. The Great Northern Racing belonging to uh, Benjamin Rhodes is actually in the sheds at the moment. Ben's actually on holiday. He's probably watching this along somewhere.
Let's keep an eye on what's happening with Kurt Stenberg. He's come out ahead of Mitch Hathaway, so that's pretty important. He's actually come out with a pretty sizable advantage over Mitch Hathaway. 41 seconds to Will Devonish. Now, Stenberg is going to be protecting his lead here with the, the tyres and the fuel that he has on board. The next question we want to look at is how deep can Will Devonish go into things? He's going around again, so getting into lap 32. So the strategies are starting to play out here a little bit, Hans. There's some people that are looking at trying to split their remaining uh, laps into, I guess, you know, certain, uh, certain sectors. So, you know, if you were doing this under green flag stopping, as we've seen before, you would split it at, say, 22, laps 22, 44, 66. Roughly, that's where you would do it. You'd get home with plenty of time to spare. Uh, Stenberg's come in a couple of laps ago, so he's coming at lap 30. Devonish now trying to maybe extend that out a little bit more. Maybe, again, play a slightly different game, take a little bit... Uh, of a shorter fill toward the end, see if, you, if the safety car comes out, perhaps insulate yourself a little bit more, shorter stop in the transit lane, gain some track position, you know, in the pit lane. Looks like you'll be in this lap though. I don't think Devonish can match uh, Stenberg for outright pace. However, if he tries to play the long game as he's doing now, he's just going a lap, a couple of laps further than Stenberg each time. So maybe that will mean a shorter fill at the end. But uh, he's managing to eke out every bit of milliliter of fuel of uh, the E85 that they use. Switched to BP Ultimate, funnily enough, this year. So you see a couple of BP Ultimate sponsored cars. And that will put uh, Brenton Foley into the lead. No, not quite. He comes in. So he's running the same strategy as Devonish. Will this put Stenberg back into the lead? And I'm wondering, Stenberg might be hurt by Burko here because Burko is right in front of him and uh, might be a bit of a hassle to try and get past him. But uh, I imagine Burko will make it pretty easy since he's the uh, on the tail end of the lead lap, last car on the lead lap. Last car running, in fact. Yes, yeah, Steve Burko, the last car running at the moment. Uh, just apologies to anyone that's watching the, uh, the live stream at the moment, just keeping an eye on the, the health check and things at the moment. There are a couple of things we are doing a little bit differently this year with just trying to see if we can up the frame rate and a few things as well. Uh, good old fibre to the premises doing as good as it can at the moment for uh, 50 megs up and uh, oh sorry 50 meg and uh, on the plant it's not doing too badly for the moment so uh, apologies if there's any little stuttering on the stream hopefully that will buffer out uh, when the stream is uh, put back together properly for posting to YouTube a bit later on uh, tomorrow when it all gets itself sorted out we did have a couple of issues last week. We think we've rectified those, but if there's any trouble, please do let us know. And we'll see if we can fix it in the short term that we have, or the time that we have available to uh, try and tidy it up for you. But Kurt Stenberg going back through to the lead and setting a pretty handy 118-1 that previous lap to solidify that lead. As we keep an eye on the outlaps for Will Devonish and Brenton Foley and Mitch Hathaway is now mixing. In actual fact, Mitch Hathaway has come out just behind Will Devonish here as well. Actually, sorry, Devonish has come out just ahead of Mitch Hathaway on a much warmer tyre, having stopped a couple of laps earlier. Will's just got to keep his eyes forward here, as the team would say to Jamie Winkup, and just start to try and reel in Stenberg again. He'd got the gap down to under seven seconds by the time the pit stops happen, so the outlap for Will is probably pretty critical here. In actual fact, he's lost well over it. Compared to the lap time that uh, Kurt Stenberg did on an outlap, Stenberg did a 125 on an outlap, and Devin's done a 126. So the full second just alone in outlap pace. So Will, I guess just, again, this game that we've been talking about here, Hans, managing tyres, managing fuel, looking at where you're going to, to stop you know, two, three, you know, four laps before your arrival or how much deeper you can go into this race and we're still not halfway to go through. A lot of racing that these drivers are not very used to, the longest race. Yeah, you're right there, Steve. I'd say that there's a bit of fatigue s setting in, but uh, the real top guys like Stenberg and Devonish, I imagine that they are well dialed into their sim rigs. And uh, Devonish, in fact, uh, I reckon, uh, on the point of in laps and he wasn't out of control, but it was just looking a bit tardy in comparison to what we've seen from Stenberg. So Stenberg, he was late on the anchors. He committed uh, fully to the pit exit. And Scott Nolan, he's managed to get in front of uh, Brent Foley again. 
And uh, these two, they're joined at the hip almost. They're twins joined at the hip, it seems. Because uh, they can't seem to get away from each other. One in the ZB Commodore, that's Scotty Nolan. And uh, Brent Foley is in the PBF Race Engineering VF. We're accustomed to seeing him flying the flag for the VF Commodore in at car one. Uh, a two-time champion now, I believe. Yeah, he's very adamant that he wasn't going to be driving a ZB this year. He wanted to stay with the VF. So, of course, that is the car that all the PBF cars, regardless whether they're the main team or the satellite team, have ended up with this year. Of course, different makes and models were available for selection this year. So, of course, Ford had the FGX, or if you wanted to run the Mustang, you could have done so. The VF or the ZB for the Holden Commodore. And then, of course, the, the Nissan up there, a little bit basic compared to the other cars that have come from there, the Super V8 mod and a few other things as well. So a bit of luck, they'll be tidied up in the future, but they still look and sound great, still go just as quickly as the bigger counterparts, the Holden and the Ford. But you're right, these two joined at the hip. Scott Nolan really trying to extract as much pace from that car as he can. You can see he's very, very leery off of some of these corners. The same off sixes again, the same off seven. It's just keeping Foley in touch here. If he did, that was a, almost a Lewis wedding moment from GT3 last year. Near fastest lap for Stenberg, not by very much, only just shaves a couple of thousands of a second off, but Foley ultimately prevails. That could have been a disaster there because they were so close together at turn eight, but fantastic driving from the both of them. And uh, Scott Nolan, he gets to see the back of the number one PBF Commodore again. And uh, I don't know if he's going to be seeing red, red mist, that is, or the red of the PBF car, Steve, because I think he's probably going to be a bit aggravated with that. And he did make a mistake down at turn nine as well, so he's probably not going to be about that as well. So that just compounds uh, the issue for Nolan. It looks like he's made an anti roll bar adjustment though, so he's not lighting up the rears quite as much. Needs a bit better uh, drive off the corner. Needs to get the back of the car rolling a bit more and uh, put the weight on the outside tyre. Maybe not. Still uh, sliding up onto the kerb, wheel spinning. I was about to say, as soon as you said that, he lit the rears up just a little bit in exactly the same spot that he did it on the previous lap as well. In actual fact, it's lost him a little bit of uh, track distance to Brenton Foley's rear wing on this particular occasion as well. But I must say, hats off to these two drivers. They have had a really good humdinger of a battle for the better part of the first half of this race. And I think they're going to be fighting it out right to the flag. What's really interesting for me, though, is that with all the scrapping that they've had... Oh, as Nolan gets oh. the fence! Nolan gets the fence. Disastrous. And that is a big, big impact. And... He's that's lost him quite a lot of let of position there to follow. Well. Oh, and he's tagged oh, the grass no, as well. No, 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 no. Oh. And he goes round. That might be a safety car if he can't get going quick enough. Oh, well done. Lit it up, got it going. But that was very that was a very, very difficult part of the course. See there? So this is the back end of him hitting the wall. And the hard part for Scott Nolan here was to gather it up. He actually was a little bit wide of the kerb and actually got both left-hand side tyres out there onto the thing and probably could have tippy-toed around that corner. He didn't have to light it up, but he gets it going. And, well, can he get back onto the back of Brenton Foley here now? He won't see the funny side of this, but that was a very good reverse entry into turn 14. I would give him 10 out of 10, mate. But uh, If I were you, I'd be staying away from that pit garage after this is all said and done. I would, I would, I would be staying away from that pit garage, actually. I like Scotty, but uh, I don't think he's going to like me very much after saying that. But uh, the car control was superb. He managed to keep that going around and uh, pluck first two. But uh, he has been showing good car control and a whole heap of speed on board. So he has the speed to get past Foley. Maybe he just needs another race to be able to get up there and show what he's made of. Oh, he almost does the same thing again. He just runs a little bit too wide and uh, nearly was going to be another disaster there. So he just needs to keep it a bit tighter into the corner, not try and use as much track. Don't try and be a hero. But uh, then again, I'm just a commentator. I can't be a bit of an expert. But uh, Scotty Nolan, he's back on track again. So he's looks like he's got back into his rhythm, thankfully. And hopefully he can try and work his way up to Foley again. And uh, we expect that the battle between Foley and Nolan, if it continues, it will be the battle for the podium, Steve. Yeah, at this stage, it's looking that way. Just watch what Kurt Stenberg does here with this second-to-last corner. So he's got the wheels right up there on the strip. That's what 
happened to Scott Nolan. He didn't quite do it the way that Kurt Stenberg just demonstrated for us almost on cue. Need to sort of get those right-hand side tyres up on the kerb, but not too much at turn 13. Ride, sort of get out of the throttle a little bit. Just feather the throttle as you come around there. Ride that kerb nicely, and then let it drift out to the left-hand side onto the brakes at the precisely the right time for turn 14. What Scott's done the last couple of laps where he had that spin and where he almost did it again was he got the kerb, but he didn't get enough of it. So, of course, he hasn't been able to feather the throttle and get it precisely the way that he wanted it and then of course the car's just understeered and gone wide because it's not been able not been settled in the right frame of you know, it's in, not in the right position for it uh, to take that corner Stenberg's lead has grown enormously in the last half a dozen laps or so it's gone from what was 10 seconds post pit stops to now nearly 20 it is almost double so he's really just been pumping in these laps 18 one was his last uh, his last lap compared to Devonish's 19-2. Of course, he did set that quickest lap of the race uh, back a few laps ago, the 117-2, sorry, 5-2-5. He's just in a class of his own at the moment. I'm surprised Stenberg didn't get a track cut going through the center chicane because in turn two, he took a lot of curve. There were all four wheels over the yellow line. So, uh, oh, he's taking a very creative line through there. He's trying to use as much road as he can. He pays for all of the road, so he might as well use it. And uh, Stenberg is putting on a masterclass at the moment because he is absolutely driving away from the ZB Commodore of Will Devonish. Will Devonish, he just doesn't have enough to fight him at the moment. Uh, short glimpses of pace, and they're going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And uh, again, no track cuts for Kurt Stenberg, so he knows exactly where the limits are, and he knows how to push them lap after lap after lap, and that is what makes him a champion driver. It certainly does, and this is a man that's got a bit of a point to prove at the moment because he was due to take part of course in ASC on Tuesday and ended up with no power at the house and uh, a whole comedy of errors there going to try and borrow a sim rig and then get up to race in that and uh, ended up missing both races in ASC. So hasn't actually run in AMS in the first round uh, at all this week and looking like he's going to do it there. A drive-through for Lewis Wedding. So Lewis Wedding currently on track is in sixth place and he's been pinned for through turn one, two and three. Is he just coming through turn four at the moment? So that's interesting. And we've got Brenton Foley actually missing a bonnet. So something has happened to Brenton Foley, probably a bit too far back for our cameras to pick up, but he's obviously had some sort of an issue somewhere, run up behind somebody or has clouded a wall, but he's still ahead of Scott Nolan by an awful margin. Foley quite ginger through that corner. Now, is he carrying some damage? This is this is game-changing stuff for Brenton Foley. And he's coming in. And that might be a bit too early, Steve. So that's an unscheduled stop for Foley. So, uh, oh, it's not steering particularly well. So he might have steering damage on board. Yeah, possibly might have some steering damage on board. As was also just getting some word through that uh, Pete Savage is out of this one as well. The internet's died over there uh, at his residence. So we're still having some issues trying to work out what has happened. Lewis Wedding now comes through to serve his drive-through penalty. So as we said, that would be for pink through the curbs at turns one, two, and three. When the quite the uh, the message came up, he was on his way to turn four. So that's where he would have been done for. Now, Dwayne Davies is coming along the main straight. Now, he's going to get the pair of these guys. So he's going to go ahead of Foley and Wedding. So the drive-through penalties. And D2 is actually on a similar strategy to the likes of Brenton Foley. So that is positional gain for the former Ford driver, who has now converted to the PBF stable this year. And, oh, my God, look at this, what's going on here. Kurt Stenberg has come out of precisely the, uh, behind Lewis Wedding, or Wedding's come out of precisely the wrong moment for Stenberg, as Wedding was all sorts of sideways through turn four, and I'm wondering whether there was a little bit of Morse code on the rear bumper there, Hans, because that was a little bit wild. I don't think it's hurt Stenberg, though, because he's still 20, 21 seconds ahead of Will Devonish, so uh, Lewis, he yields just before turn eight, but uh, welcome back to E2. We haven't seen him... Uh, that much in this race and he's just been quietly chipping away so the quiet achiever Dwayne Davies 
he's actually ahead of his teammate, or his team boss rather. So uh, good to see the Bundaberg PBF racing car up there. Oh, someone's gone into the wall. So, uh, that was Stenberg, Stenberg into the wall. Well, we're going to go back and have a bit of a look at this and see if we can pick up what precisely happened to Kurt Stenberg because he had gotten past Lewis Wedding on that particular lap. So that was down on the run between turns seven and eight. Let's see what the upshot of this is. Through turn 11, did he just get wide? Yeah, the answer is yes. Got a huge amount of a tank slapper on. Clouted the wall with the rear right corner of that car. So hopefully no damage on the Watts linkage or on that side there. And just, just struggled a little bit to pull it up for turn 14 by the looks of things there as well. So we will watch that with interest. He's actually gone back behind Wedding again now. So... This is Stenberg and Wedding, take two. There was a little bit of joking around when it was uh, listed down that Kurt Stenberg was going to run a few races in AMS Oz Supercars this year. And uh, it was a joke was Stenberg versus Wedding, uh, round one, please send an invite. Oh, did Stenberg get the wall there? Somebody got the wall. I heard on the camera that one of them got the wall, just glanced as they went past. So hoping for Stenberg's sake that he hasn't got any damage that's causing that car just to step out of alignment at precisely the wrong moment. Yeah, it's not ideal for Stenberg. He got the rear on the uh, tyre barrier and that knocked him into the concrete wall. So a bit more... Actually, because the concrete wall, it might have given him some steering damage. So he might have a bit of toe in, toe out on the front wheel. Probably I'm going to go with toe in because the car was a bit... Didn't look that nice through turn eight. Looks all right through the centre chicane though. Up through turn three now to turn four. And then uh, I, I've been to Adelaide a couple of times, but I can't remember the street names for the life of me. So uh, if only we had stairs or bags are here to help us out. No, there'll be plenty of, uh, they'd be out there saying, well, this is this corner, this is Wakefield Street, this is, you know, Bartels Road and all that sort of stuff. They'd, they'd know it off the back of their, uh, off like the back of their hand, the streets of Adelaide. Of course, Bags, he calls Melbourne home for the for the short term for some of the study work that he's doing at the moment. Just those things, well, Scott Nolan has jumped up into the podium places now. That's by virtue of Mitch Hathaway coming in and having a pit stop. Of course, he's one of the cars that's off sequence to the majority of the field. That's something that's going to become a little bit more important, not so much in this race, but a bit later on in the year. There is a a sharing of pit booms for team cars so we just run through the list you can see that the the pbf race engineering cars of brenton foley and phil boke sharing a pit boom so to uh the satellite teammates brennan ross and dwayne davies you get people like ben rhodes who's in the great northern the pbf great northern racing car sharing a pit boom with blake tilbrook um, as part of that setup there so there's a few drivers that are sharing with other drivers that may or may not um, I'll say some drivers may be happy with it some drivers may not be happy with it but when you get an incident like a safety car you're then going to have to queue so you don't want to be doing that too often you want to be able to time your run so in a race like this at the moment where a number of drivers are off sequence to everybody else it's not such a big issue in actual fact that when the safety car came in with where everybody was people like Kurt Stenberg who's sharing with Colin Warwick who's not here had a pit boom all to himself. So too, Brent Foley had a boom all to himself. So it wasn't an issue at that particular juncture of the race, and it was very, very early too. It's sort of scrambled that strategy a little bit. It'll start to play out as we get to some of the uh, the longer distance races again. The, uh, the 175 kilometer races will involve pit stops later in the year. Of course, we've got the calendar, which we'll look forward to uh, in a little while at the end of this race showing you precisely where the next rounds are. So there's the sprint rounds, there's the, the long 175 kilometre races. Um, sprint rounds do not require uh, the pit stop from what I understand. They've been talking about whether or not that may happen or not. But as far as I'm aware, it's just a flat out sprint race for those ones as well. The next round's going to be the, uh, the Melbourne uh, twin sprint. So two twin sprint races coming up in about a month's time would you believe so it's probably about oh, three or four weeks I think till the next race so plenty of time for these drivers to have a little bit of a rest some of them are actually going to be opening their account in GT3 competition on March 10 
for Automobilista Australia GT3 Series for the World Series that one is there's three series this year World Series the Sprint Series and then we've got the Endurance Triple Crown a bit later on in the year and of course TCR Oz and uh, Track Day Challenge are opening up next week so that's the uh, 3rd and 4th of March, sorry, 2nd and 3rd of March, I believe, actually. So they will be up and running. So plenty of drivers going into combat in multiple categories this year. Will Devonish is one of those, taking on GT3. Brent Foley's doing TCR, he's also doing GT3 as well. So pretty full dance card for some of these drivers, getting plenty of seat time. But uh, at the moment, it's not helping their cause very, very much because this man is still well and truly clear out in front. Truly dominating performance, Steve. Not unlike what we saw from Brenton Foley at Bathurst last year, so uh, I don't think he's uh, getting ready to go slow anytime soon. He's just beating them into submission, and uh, he's taking that car by the scruff of the neck. Uh, oh, you can see he's pushing real hard through there, trying to get to full throttle as quick as he can. But uh, as we move into a bit of a lull now, uh, for those interested, uh, Phillip Island Classic, there's going to be some 5 litre touring cars and Pro Project Blueprint era V8 supercars out there. So it might be a good event to see uh, if you're a fan of your V8s. Just get down there. Uh, Phillip Island Classic uh, Festival of Motorsport. Uh, good event. Larry Perkins will be there in the... Oh, I'm not paid to promote this, by the way. I'm just a fan. I just want to see some people down there. So especially from AMS Oz. I want to meet some more people. But uh, the Larry Perkins 2003 Bathurst car will be there as, uh, as it raced at the 2003 Bathurst uh, 1000 and uh, very famous iconic Castrol car and uh, also the Grand Prix. Hope to see some people at the Grand Prix as well because I'll be going, I think, hopefully. But uh, it would be nice to get some of the AMS boys out there and, uh, you know, we all hang out and enjoy enjoy some real life racing for once. And uh, hopefully, you know, for those of us uh, that have p potentially crashed into each other tonight, we're still on speaking terms, I hope. Yeah, I think you're probably right. A number of these drivers in real life do go to a number of the, the real life races. Um, and there have been a few from AMS Oz catch up over the, the course of time as well at, at the racetrack, which is great to see. Well, we've got 30 laps to run, or just under 30 laps to run now, so well over truly past the half distance mark. We'll do a quick run through this order. So Kurt Stenberg has, as you said, Hans, got this race by the scruff of the neck right now. Leads comfortably. Will Devonish has really not been able to match the pace in this third stint. Second stint, he was there or thereabouts. He was ebbing and flowing. The gap was ebbing and flowing between himself and uh, Kurt Stenberg. He had, did have the gap down to seven seconds at one point before the pit stops, but since then, it has been the trans Tasman racing show well and truly. Mitch Hathaway is doing a really good job at the moment. He's now moved back into P3. Scott Nolan's just come into the pit lane. So again, this off-sequence strategy is starting to play out. We'll come back to this discussion in a little minute because I've just, in the back of my mind, I've just worked out a couple of things. Brent Foley has now gone through to P4. He is a lap down to Kurt Stenberg, having come in unscheduled for damage repair. Scott Nolan's going to come out in P5 out of has his... He's still going to have one more stop to go after this. Blake Tilbrook again. Oh, just as we cut to him as well, around he goes at the final corner. Can he get that refired and back around? Yes, he can. And Good signs for Blake. Oh, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, Steve. Good signs for Blake. Uh, just because we cut to him at that point and saw him spin around. He's actually doing a really good job. I'm impressed by Blake uh, so far tonight. We'll be seeing more of him this year. Yeah, hopefully we will. And he's inside the top six. I was just about to say, I kept liking what he was doing with regards to strategy, just running the tank down, just running his own race and letting the race sort of come to him. He's a newcomer to AMS Oz, so I hope he's enjoying his time with the team. He's got a nice big dint in the driver's door there, so he's been run into at some point by somebody. Lewis Wedding, he served the drive through. He's not too far behind Blake Tilbrook at the moment. He's in P7, going about his own business. Cam Rutledge has moved into, uh, was in the top 10 to begin with. He's up one spot. And then the remainder inside the top 10 is Dwayne Davies, having taken another stop just there. Termo, who started eighth, has now found himself in position number 10. Unfortunate early victim of the 
first lap collisions between the HDS and loose sim sport cars and uh, got run into by Steve Burko's Volvo when he had nowhere to go. So looks like that's going to end up being a racing incident. Steve, speaking of HDS and loose sim sport, VDS is in 11th place. He's had a real quiet run, had a bit of an incident earlier on in the race that we couldn't quite put our finger on what it was, but very quick, but ended up, I think, having an early stop or touring the pits early or lost quite a lot of time. And then the last classified runner at the moment is Steve Burko, the Top Gear Racing Volvo. Looking a little bit second rate in the front there. I'm not sure if that's just the the light glistening off the front of that car. He's always having an awful amount of trouble controlling that car at the moment. But that looks like that, that Volvo's run into something somewhere along the line. And of course, we've lost three drivers from this race already. We've lost two of the loose sim sport cars in Pete Savage and Zach Ross and we've also lost the sole Scuderia Alitalia car of Glenn Miles and Hans you're signaling that the race leader is in Kurt Stenberg is in for a scheduled stop it looks like he's gone a bit early so he hasn't run the tank fully down so he's trying to minimize the uh, splash towards the end I believe Steve so uh, off he goes so uh, yeah so four tires and fuel on board so uh, where does that put him out? That puts Will Devonish into the lead temporarily. And, He'll uh, put Will Kurt Devenish Stenberg up. into second place, I think, because at the moment, uh, Mitch Hathaway's still down here at turn eight. So still plenty of time for Stenberg to get out of the lane and on the move. In actual fact, it's going to be a comfortable hole for second place in a minute. He's going to come out into some traffic, though. I've just heard, I think, the Volvo go past, and maybe the Mercedes as well. There goes Blake Tilbrook's Mercedes. So the Volvo went through. The Mercedes went through, and there's another one ranging up behind as well, which is Lewis Wedding. So Stenberg's going to have some traffic to come into contention with here. Hopefully it shouldn't take too long to clear it. I want to come back to this point that I was going to make about Mitch Hathaway being in third place at the moment. Having this battle with Scott Nolan over what is essentially the last podium spot. Now, Hathaway came in around about the lap 44 mark, and we're saying we're getting about... 20 to 22 laps worth of fuel in a stint, provided you can make it last that long. This puts Mitch Hathaway in the prime position to make it, from that point onwards, he was always going to have one more stop to get home. Scott Nolan came in about half a dozen laps ago. That means he's now got one more to go as well, which means the way it's going to work, Hathaway will stop first. He'll be overtaken by Scott Nolan. Then it'll go back around the other way, and that's just provided they stay with roughly the distances they are apart right now. So at the moment, it's going to be advantage to Mitch Hathaway in the battle for the final podium spot. Yeah, it will look good for Scott Nolan in the short term, but then in the long term, uh, Mitch Hathaway will undercut him again. So perhaps uh, Mitch Hathaway's strategy, we, we were a bit confused by it. We were a bit looking, uh, we had question marks popping up over our heads, but uh, I think Mitch Hathaway, that strategy is working quite well for him at the moment, and uh, it's still yet to play out, but once it does, maybe we will see a result for Mitch Hathaway, potentially a podium, and uh, pretty impressive to see him go back to back on the podium 2019-2020, uh, so uh, it would be good to see uh, a return to form for Mitch Hathaway, we haven't seen him on the podium for a while. No, certainly hasn't, and as you did say, it was this race last year, the 150k race that we ran, the the, uh, the 55 uh, lap affair, yet last year, where he drove from the rear of grid to the front of the field. Mind you, we did have a little bit of help with uh, a couple of internet disconnections from some of the other competitors and a little bit of tardy driving, and ultimately he won that race. And it does remain, it's not officially written down in history, but from the size of grids that we have seen, it is the lowest ever grid position slot in AMSL's supercars to, pre uh, to present a winning uh, car from. So 20, I think it was 24th or 23rd place, I think it was he started from, and he picked them all off, and it's the, the lowest ever winning position to start a race. Yeah, really impressive. I don't think the starting position quite reflected his... Uh his pace on board that time, so I mean, he's a pretty good he's a pretty good driver and he's a pretty good operator. So he knows how to get around the circuit, the Adelaide Street circuit. Meanwhile, we're just looking at Will Devonish. I guess uh, a bit of time in the sun for Devonish. I'm not sure if he's got one more stop to make, Steve. He's got one more stop to make. So Will Devonish, a uh, bit of time in the sun for him. 
He's trying to get to the critical lap number here, which we did pick up was going to be around lap 56. So if you can get 22 laps of fuel uh, out of your car, your critical lap number is 56. So Stenberg's come in a little bit too early. And if he wants to get home from here, he's going to have to do an awful amount of fuel saving. So I'm, I don't know, I'm on a little bit of tenterhooks here because I think that Stenberg is going to have to still build quite a lot more margin than what he has. You can see right now the margin is 21 odd seconds, although Kurt is taking some time out of Will's time right here. So last lap around for Devonish is a 19.481. Stenberg yet to cross the line, but his previous lap prior to this one was an 18.401 so and that was the second lap after he or the first flying lap after his full out lap we have a look at the time as he crosses the line this time and it's an 18.3 so still taking some time out of will but he really has got to turn the jets on in this last little stanza of uh of the race so this particular stint he's really got to turn the jets on he's going to have that short splash and dash so it might be line ball to see where he comes out relative to Will Devonish, probably in about, tw uh, you know, maybe about 10 or so laps time. Just depends on where he wants to take the next stop. He can take it probably any point in time from the next, in about three or four laps time, he could come in, splash to the end, and then it'd just be a straight shot right to the very end. So interesting to see how he plays this one out. Yeah, I've, he's not gone the fuel saving route, actually. He's just gone, he's just going, you know, 10 tenths at the moment. You're hearing him scrape the wall a little bit. Will Devonish is into the pit lane. So uh, we're going to see something happen here. He's going to go and he's gonna, he's actually made it to the critical lap, lap number, Steve. Has he? No, he's not made it. So he's one lap short. He's one lap short. He's actually coming on 55. So he's going to have to get 23 laps out of a tank here. So this is going to be a real touch and go here. So he did try and extend it. There's Stenberg in the background going around the final corner, Steve Burko. So Stenberg will retake the lead of this race back. We've actually just lost break Blake Tilbrook as well in the last couple of laps as well. So that's a shame. He was tracking really, really nicely to try and uh, have a really good solid result on his first outing in Automobilista Australia. Devnish now on the move. He's got a long way to go. Stenberg's already up at turn four. And this is an awful amount of time that Devonish is going to the lose here. So first sector times are a mid-22. Devonish hasn't even gotten out of the pits yet. So he's going to be some nearly, uh, by the time this is over and done with, he's going to be probably almost 30, close to 30 seconds in arrears of Kurt Stenberg. And, well, this is really now for Will Devonish, a fuel mileage race. He's actually come out behind Mitch Hathaway too. So he's not that far behind Mitch Hathaway. What does Will do here? Mitchell's probably going to come in, I'd imagine, in probably the next uh, 10 laps, sometime in the next 10 laps. Anytime Mitch Hathaway can come in now, he could get to the flag from here. Anybody that comes in right now can make this, can get to the finish of this race. I think Will Devonish has boxed himself into a fuel saving strategy. Now, the problem is, if Mitch Hathaway catches up to the back of Will Devonish, that's Will Devonish over and out. He's going to finish behind Mitch Hathaway for sure. And if that's for the fight for second place, that's advantage Mitch, ha Mitch Hathaway. So Stenberg, he's gone the complete opposite route. He is, he's turned the afterburners on. He is going 10 tenths. He is pushing as much as he can to try and build a lead so then he can make his final splash and dash. But uh, the surprise packet might be Mitch Hathaway again, Steve. I reckon that if Kurt Stenberg can't get enough of a lead and... Uh, I mean, it's 24 seconds just that lap gone. So just over the control line, it's 24 seconds. So if he can't get to about 30 seconds, then potentially Mitch Hathaway may come out ahead of Stenberg, Steve. Not sure what you think about it, but uh, let's get your thoughts, Steve. I think it's a bit of a long shot considering Stenberg's last lap was a 17.743 compared to Hathaway's 19.480. Now, granted... Stenberg is on a much newer tyre right now. Mitch Hathaway is well and truly into his tyre stint. And I think that the battle for Mitch Hathaway is really going to be a, a fight for the podium position number three. Will Devonish is 10 seconds in arrears of Mitch Hathaway. We have a look at the outlap again. Devonish is outlap at 26.7, which is actually slower than the last outlap he did as well. He was a 26.0 last time I saw uh, on the previous pit stop, not the most recent pit stop, the one before that. 
So I'm a bit worried that Will has gone into a fuel saving mode. Look at this first sector time was at 22.6 compared to others around him doing 22.4. Stenberg at a 21.9 on the last one as well. So Stenberg knows he's got to get that margin to save some fuel. Devonish's middle sector wasn't too bad. It was a 21, sorry, a 31.9 compared to others around him doing a, a low 32. So 19.5 for Devonish. He's just starting to ramp that pace up a little bit now, but I think if he can, he probably needs to, he'll have a drive, uh, a fuel number that he'll need to drive to here. He'll have a, he, he's got all the tools at his disposal. He'll have a lap counter. He'll have a fuel per lap and a lap time and a delta that he needs to run to in order to make it to this flag. Keeping in mind too, he's also got to make it back around into the pit lane after this is all done as well. The little yellow flag down here at turn uh, six and seven that's been quickly withdrawn. I'm thinking that might have been for the car just ahead of Will Devonish, which looks like that might be the number 11 car of Billy Doobal Salonga, the 11th place car rather of Billy Doobal Salonga, just going ahead of him through turn eight and indeed it is so the strategy game I think is well and truly in play here more so for Mitch Hathaway and Scott Nolan because they're both going to have to stop now Brenton Foley's the the unknown equation in this one as well he has come in and has taken some service unscheduled he is going to have to stop again same as Scott Nolan is same as Mitch Hathaway is, but they're all going to stop at different points in time. So we expect that Mitch Hathaway will be in first, probably followed by Scott Nolan, probably followed by Brenton Foley, I'd imagine. So Kurt Stenberg, he's opened up a massive lead on Mitch Hathaway. It's gone up 10 seconds in the last few laps. And, uh, you know, it's around about hovering about that 33, 35 second mark. And I believe that puts it, I mean, what I was saying before, like you said, was a long shot, but now it's advantage Stenberg. So Stenberg is looking pretty good at the moment. I'm actually just seeing that Mitch Hathaway had a really poor last lap as well. He did a minute 25.2. Now, that's normally a lap time you'd associate with going into the pit lane. In actual fact, uh, we must have called that incorrectly. We must have said it was uh, the Billy Doogle Salonga car going around causing that yellow flag. It looks like it might have been Mitch Hathaway in sector two on the previous lap. So his middle sector was a 37.6. He'd been doing high 31s, low 32s in the middle sector. So that suggests that he had quite a moment somewhere in that middle sector. And that's where all that time's gone in one foul sweep. Pretty much half that 10 second advantage that or the extra 10 seconds that Stenberg has found since the pit stop has all gone just in a matter of one sector on one lap. So that actually now means that Will Devonish is a lot closer to the back of Mitch Hathaway than he can see. And it puts Mitch Hathaway under a little bit of pressure from Scott Nolan, Brenton Foley, in that when this strategy all starts to pan out, uh, let's have a look at the lap times that they're doing. So Hathaway's last one was a 19.5. Nolan also with a 19.5. Foley with a 19.6. So they're all now on similar lap times and going to be stopping, as we said, probably within the, now probably within the next half a dozen laps we expect this to, to play out. What we don't expect to play out is the change in lead here because even though Stenberg's got to stop again, we well, don't expect that it's going to be for very long. Have a look at the different line he's using there, Hans. He's using a lot of kerb on the outside at turn one. He's actually moving across to the outside of the, the approach to turn one. He's actually got two wheels on the right-hand side up over the, the curbing that divides the pit lane and the racetrack, which is not something we've seen a lot of before. But as you kept saying, I think a little while ago in the broadcast, maximizing every millimeter of racetrack that's at your disposal. There it is again, right out to the fence in the run between turns six and seven. He, ac he actually went beyond the track limits there, so all four wheels were over the yellow line. So uh, a bit of a no-no there, Stenny. But uh, Stenny, he knows what he's doing, Kurt Stenberg. He definitely is a very, very good driver and uh, a master of all sorts of sims. We've typically seen him in iRacing and uh, he's making his return back to Automobilista Australia, doing a few races this season. We usually see him at ASC competition. And uh, he puts on a masterclass there. He's putting on a masterclass tonight. So we're going to get a good look again. And you say, there was the other thing you said before. You just get the right wheels up there. You put the load on the left wheels. Get the car to turn nicely. 
Then he lights it up, coming onto the main straight, just out of 14. And uh, we're going to see this now. So see, he goes up, and he's trying to straighten the run into turn one and two as much as he can. See there, straighten it up as much as you can. And uh, keep the lock off it, actually. So um, he's using the curves to actually turn the car and change the direction. So it's usually a thing that's used with the heavier cars with small tyres. So uh, that's a technique to be able to use the weight of the car shifting over the curbs to actually turn the car. So we see it in some of the other categories as well. We see it in supercars, we see it in uh, uh, saloon cars even, sports sedans. It's used to great effect in real life racing. And uh, Stenny is just the master of it at the moment. We should get him into a real life race car and see how he goes there because he might be on the money. Oh, he got almost. the fence. He got the fence there, so like we were saying before, he's using every millimetre of road, and then maybe a little bit more, so I guess it's the uh, the Ayrton Senna type thing, you know, the wall moves about 40 mil, and then he says, oh, running wide there, oh, geez, that gave me heart palpitations. Yeah, he almost did that for a second time, he did it earlier in the race, and he almost did it again, just a little bit out of control, going through turn 11 yet again. One thing that I just picked up on, and I might just see if we can pick it up again when he comes down to the run between turns four and five, is I think he actually went up to third gear, which is not something we typically see. It A number of drivers tend to rev it out and just let it bounce on the limiter. Let's go back on board with Stenberg and have a listen here. So second gear, this is through turn four. Have a listen. Yep, he goes up to third gear and then comes back to second. There's some drivers, and on this little run here, there you could hear it onto the rev limiter. So a little bit of a different driving style compared to some of the other competitors. The second, use the engine braking a little bit more for turn five. Well, Stenberg's doing the complete opposite. He's going up a gear and coming back a gear. That could just be a natural feel of things. We just don't quite know. Um, you learn a lot of different things from dip watching different people and a number of drivers out there watching along in the live stream or watching after they've crashed out of it or watching this back a bit later on. This is what you want to be watching. Now, the cog has come out for Kurt Stenberg here, so we expect that he's just preparing to take on, ooh, a little moment off the final corner there, just preparing to take his final stop for this little splash and dash, coming out ahead of the number 31 car of Mitch Hathaway. So Hathaway has taken service for the final time. So we did say he was going to be in probably around in the last next half a dozen laps and he's come in on lap 60 end of lap 63 for Mitch Hathaway and so that puts Scott Nolan back up into P3 so we do expect that the Synergy Sim Racing car has got to stop again or well, we know he's got to stop again it's going to be a matter of when Kurt Stenberg I think it's interesting we'll just talk about the third gear point uh, in a minute just coming out of turn four that shows how quick his exit speed is out of turn four so that car is really working for him, and not only that, he's managing to, you know, squeeze the lemon so to speak, he's getting every every millimetre out of it. So, uh, I guess he's making the decision there, it's faster to just shift up into third, then shift back into second, than it is to, I mean, the extra speed that that entails as well. Here we go, Scott Nolan in. And uh, just to finish that point about Stenberg, uh, that shows that uh, he's able to... I mean, if it's slower for him to drag the rev limiter, then he might as well shift it up into third. And I guess that shows what sort of class of driver he is. He's getting all those little advantages out. He, all these little, you know, incremental gains, you know, coming into turn one, then through the chicane, then up through turn four and the exit, shifting up into third. So uh, I guess that shows uh, what we're going to be dealing with all season. Speaking of shifting up into third, the strategy has played out for Mitch Hathaway as Scott Nolan has come in, and that's actually a no contest. Mitch Hathaway is well and truly clear at the moment. Scott Nolan, I think, is his final service. In actual fact, Brenton Foley must have come in as well because Foley has now stayed ahead of Scott Nolan, and he was ahead a little while ago. So um, that's worked out really, really nicely for Mitch Hathaway with a comfortable advantage. But it'll be interesting to see whether or not Scott Nolan, with some fresh rubber on board, is going to be able to hone in on this man, Brenton Foley, just waiting to see where he is in back of shot. He's 11 seconds behind. It looked like it was going to be a little bit closer than that. And he's got another, what's he got there? He's got another 14 or 15 laps to go to see if he can catch Brenton Foley, who is probably just limping a little bit to the line here. Terminator's a good job getting out of the way off of turn 11. 
One thing about Turn 11 that I've been noticing all night, Hans, is the drivers that are super, super confident at taking that turn at great pace. Kurt Stenberg is a master of it. He just seems to carry a lot more speed through there than any of the other drivers. Scott Nolan does a good job as well. Another few other drivers are just a little bit too tentative, just trying to make sure they can get the car turned. You've got to use that inside kerb on the left-hand side to sort of bump the car around a little bit. If you were watching the broadcast last week, you would have seen the hot lap from Will Devonish that he talked about hitting that inside kerb and being able to just rotate the car a little bit more. Because if you're just trying to use the road and nothing else, you're not going to get that grip from the tyre. You've really got to have that kerb to just help kick the car around a little bit, just to point it in the right direction. And then if you can pick up the throttle, use all that kerb on the exit, and as a few people have done tonight, leave a nice little coat of paint on the outside rear barrier as well on the right-hand side. I think potentially people will have to try and take a later apex through there, and uh, once you hit the kerb, you monster the kerb, and then you straighten up the wheels so the car, so the car all that, oh, here we go, Kurt Stenberg's in. We'll talk about that point later, but Kurt Stenberg, like you're saying, he's the master of turn 11, and uh, he's coming in for his final pit stop now. We'll see how many seconds of fuel he pumps in. He's just making his way up to his pit stall. I don't expect him to be stationary very long. He's actually taking tyres as well, so fuel's the... That's brave. Fuel's the limiting factor, I think. This is probably just an insurance policy, as a couple of commentators say. You've got to make every post a winner, and Kurt's just giving, buying himself a little bit of an insurance policy here to make sure every post of his is a winner. Hathaway's gone through, but that's not the position. He's come out ahead of Scott Nolan, and well and truly clear of second place man Will Devonish is only just coming around the final corner now. So we've got 12 laps to run and the margin, while it has shrunk, Devonish is very much in a fuel conservation mode right now. And his last lap time is a 19.2. So he's consistently doing 19s. We actually expected that that's where most of the race pace was going to be into the, the high 18s, low 19s. But been on screens taking it to another level in some cases dropping into low 18s and it's really just showing the way and showing what it's going to be what it's going to take to win this year's championship all he's got to do now is keep it on the blacktop for another 11 and a half laps and he'll have himself 300 points now wouldn't it be fitting if you managed to lap Britton Foley coming up to the final lap that'd be pretty interesting especially last year's champion. A very dominating performance tonight by Kurt Stenberg. There's only four cars on the lead lap, including Stenberg. So, oh, yellow flag, oh, quickly withdrawn. So that would have been someone coming into pit. And uh, Kurt Stenberg, what a master, masterful performance tonight. Tactics have been A-grade. Driving has been A-grade. And uh, if he can come home with the win, the conversion rate from pole position to win is A grade as well, Steve. So, uh, fantastic way to start the year. And uh, if he can continue, he's a very, uh, he's gonna be up there in the championship for sure. Yeah, he's gonna be a very hard man to beat. He won't get the Grand Schlem, which of course, in motorsport terms, is the pole, the win, the fastest lap, and leading every lap of the race. He did not lead every lap of this race because of the safety car intervention but he has led the majority of laps. I think we'll probably have to do the math here. I think he's probably led well and truly over 75% of this race distance to date and will be 75% of race distance before, uh, sorry, when we get to the chequered flag. Brendan Ross watching along in the live chat as well and good to see you, Rossi, as well. He's actually just mentioned Lewis Wedding a lap down is the first that's been seen in a very, very long time. I think you're absolutely right there, Rossi. Very, very rare do we see Lewis Wedding a lap down. Of course, he had to make an extra tour of the pit lane because of a drive-through penalty. He got pinged for curb strikes at turn one, two, and three. And that's very, very rare in Lewis Wedding, unlike Lewis Wedding. We've got a yellow flag down here again at uh, turn number 14. Just quickly withdrawn. New fastest lap for Kurt Stenberg, so he shaved about a tenth and a half off of his PB. And of course, that's now a new race lap record, 1 minute 17.391. So, well, it's going to take an awful effort to be able to topple him in just about any race this year, I think, Hans. We're uh, 
we were salivating at the prospect that there was going to be some really, really good racing this year. And when we have seen in the early stages and when the safety car restart happened as well, it's been some fantastic racing and some fantastic passing. But, well, we might have to see what happens in the sprint race, I think, because it looks like the, uh, the endurance races are going to start to become a bit of a formality now, aren't they? Yeah, potentially. I mean, Stenberg, just what a... I mean, I can't, I can't say it enough how good he's been tonight. It's just been such a dominating performance. And, uh, you know, we're going to be hard past to look past him at a fa as a favourite for probably most of the season coming. But, uh, you know, just... Uh, well, what else can I say apart from Kurt Stenberg? He's just... He's a master at ASC. He's a master in AMS Oz. So he's really showing them how, how to do it. And... Uh, the other drivers, they're going to need to go back to the drawing board and come up with something to stop this uh, this Stenny attack, because or this, the assault from Kurt Stenberg's number 47 Commodore, he's just absolutely beating this race into submission, and uh, you know he's just it just the car looks as good now as it did on lap one. He's just really wringing its neck, and he's using every curb, everything to just make the car turn a little better, make it perform a little bit better, and uh, I mean. We probably would have expected a bit of a closer race, Steve, but uh, maybe we'll have to reserve that. Oh, oh here we big go. whack of the fence. Big whack of the fence. Did he get the inside curb while he was at it? That was very, very unsteady like out of control. Let's go and pick that up again. I want to see whether he got the inside of turn number eight here because it looked really, really strange, but supreme amount of car control to keep it straight and not end up nose into the fence. Let's have a look. Did he get the inside? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yeah. He absolutely got the inside of that. He rode well over the curb, took way too much curb. It didn't look like it and didn't hear like it from the broadcast, but you could actually see visibly when he went past that part of the circuit, he did get that inside fence. So mistakes just going to start to creep well, again, in a little he's bit. In the, he's in the turn three exit wall. He was in the turn three exit wall again. He just glanced at side on and the car moved back and forth. But... Uh, Stenberg, he's still pushing, he's still pushing, he's trying to beat it into submission as much as he can, he's about 20 seconds ahead of Will Devnish, Stenny, I don't think you need to keep pushing, he's probably going to watch that back and he's going to say, no, I need to keep pushing, but, uh, well, just, uh, it, I guess he's bringing us some entertainment in this race, which is good, I mean, we're getting to the tail end of the race and we don't know if he's going to wipe his car on the fence again, because he is still pushing really hard, which is good to see. Left a margin for error there that time, so I think he's just... Decided, no, it's got to settle down a bit. Got, a, got enough of a margin, although that being said, he's gone yeah, deep under brakes there. Go. So still pushing the limits a little bit. But he doesn't need to be doing that. He's got a comfortable large, and he's only got seven more laps to go to reach a checkered flag. A little bit of a coat of paint on the turn 11 fence. Will Devonish just knows that oh, there's a bonnet there. There's a HDS so bonnet there yeah, as well. I'm yeah. going to figure out who that belongs to. It's not Mitch Hathaway, which means it's probably got BDS. to be Billy Doogle Salonga. Let's rotate through the field and see if that confirms the story. And the answer to that is yes. So BDS has had an issue somewhere at turn eight. So he's probably done something similar to what we just saw Kurt Stenberg do, but has come off a little bit more worse for wear. Minute 23, that last lap will be the reason for that. And we have a look at his lap times. Uh, and we can see that his last sector, the middle sector, was a 34.76. So he's obviously had it coming together with the wall, but still going to continue on. Bit of a dint in the passenger side doors there. Last runner on the track. Last classified runner. The others having not been any classified, they haven't completed enough of the, the race distance. You've got to get to 75% race distance to be classified if you do not finish the race. And if you work that out for 78 laps, you will find that that comes to approximately 58 laps. So everybody that is on the circuit, if they were to not finish this race now, if they would DNF for any reason, they would still be classified. Blake Tilbrook, unfortunately, the last runner that did not finish the race or retired from the race, had only completed 52 laps. So he was six laps shy of a classified finish. It's pretty rough for Blake Tilbrook, but uh, Steve, I've had a bit of a brainwave in the last 30 seconds. Kurt Stenberg, maybe a bit of fatigue setting in, and he's making a bit of these mistakes. So we've seen Devnish, he's buttoned it off just ever so slightly, so he's not creeping into the mistakes quite as much. I think he knows that the lead is a lost cause now, so he's just trying to hold station, not to do too any, if I can get my words out, not do anything too dramatic. 
but uh, Kurt Stenberg is uh, maybe a bit of fatigue setting in. And with some of these setups that you use with a lot of brake force required, you know, braking uh, uh, in terms of if you setting more towards a real life sort of race car braking, 80 kilograms force, 90 kilograms force, you're going to fatigue yourself pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, that's even without the G force, it's still uh, quite hard work to be able to. Um, break whether you're a left foot or right foot breaker, all that sort of stuff. It's a it's a whole other thing. So, um, but uh, Kurt Steberg is definitely the number one in terms of uh, being able to drive this sort of distance, and this will be relevant as well for the Bathurst uh, 500 or the Bathurst 1000 or whatever, however long we're going with that. I don't even know yet. We don't know. Incidentally, a penalty for BDS, so probably overuse of track limits again. And uh, he's run out of chances there. Can't take it. No, that's, take. A, uh, that's a pit lane speeding offence, actually. He's actually just come out of pit lane. I think he went in to repair some of that damage. So that's a pit limiter infringement. Whoops. So, yeah, whoops. The, uh, the police are out in force and uh, they've pinged him for speeding in the pit lane. 1k over the speed limiter. That's uh, double demerits. But, certain, uh, times, certain times of the year it is. Certain times of the year. But yeah, it's interesting, uh, for Bathurst this will be interesting because um, you've got to be happy with the car if you're doing a long stint, double stint, that sort of stuff. Kurt Stenberg will probably do a double stint, so we can expect him to be pretty happy with the ergonomics of his sim rig. And, uh, you know, he's just... Like, is there anyone that can beat him? We don't know. He needs to be consistent, but uh, if he keeps putting on these performances, you never know. It might be number one on the door next year. It's a bit early to say, but there are a whole heap of contenders. They want that number one on the door. They want to rip it off Brenton Foley. And uh, Brenton Foley, he's still struggling along now. No bonnet on the car. Probably a bit worse for wear. But he's trying to go down swinging. And uh, no shortage of trying for Foley, actually. So, uh, yeah. We often joke at the moment, Brenton Foley has uh, a child at the moment and children slow you down. His child's actually, in fact, a puppy. So... We keep saying, well, you're going to end up with the same thing that happens with my two cats. They come and rub under your legs while you're sitting in the sim rig and, you know, they all want the attention that's there. I said, you're going to have the same thing. You're going to have this puppy running under your legs and wanting attention while you're driving. And he was very adamant, no, 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 no. The puppy's not going to be anywhere in the room while the racing is happening. But... I wouldn't be so sure, you know, there's probably a few other little things that are creeping in there as well. And we did say, this is a man that, as he gets the fence on the exit of turn eight, much the same as everybody else has done tonight, this is a man that pretty much hadn't done any practice whatsoever between the last round at Oran Park last year and this particular race. He's done no running in AMS Oz in between those races, aside from the GT3 one, which was the week after Oran Park, sorry. He hasn't done any practice running in any of other series. He hasn't, we haven't seen him in ARW either. Uh, Apex rear wing, the uh, logo there on the rear wing of the car. So he's not really match fit, I guess, is what you can probably call it. He hasn't got his eye in. Um, did really, really well to run with third place in the shootout, but he has now ended up going to end up fourth on the road. And a very, very rare mistake for Foley, having made some sort of an error somewhere along the line. We'll get more from him a bit later on when we have a chat to the top three. But that bonnet obviously came along or came ajar from hitting a wall somewhere so be keen to find out what precisely happened. Um, coincidentally, teammates to Brenton Foley is uh, Phil Boak and Brendan Ross and a few others and Rossi has just mentioned that Foley's car is just finally coming to him now. If we take a look at some of the lap times he's doing, 18.9 is his last lap. His best is an 18.4 so if that is the case, it's just starting to feel a bit happier in the car. Far cry from some of the lap times that others are doing, and Stenberg's deci finally decided to back it off, and in actual fact, Will Devonish was pinned for track violation on the previous lap as well. So, a little bit too late for this man to pull out the stops. We really need to pull him out a bit earlier. Well, as we say that, he Whoa. just got two wheels on the grass there. Graceful drift through the final corner, bagged it up, and away he went. And uh, if I want to make more enemies tonight, I'm going to say that that was a pretty good drift as well. So uh, Foley, he's having a bit of fun there. And I think he'll appreciate it more than Scott Nolan would. So um, pretty good car control from the both of them. So really good to see that they've both managed to keep it going. 
and not as much more as a bruised ego and the car still lives to fight another day. Certainly does. Our race leader is probably not too far away from starting his final tour. He's halfway through or nearly halfway through the second to last lap. A little bit of lap traffic. As I said, he's just buttoned off his pace a little bit. The last lap, the previous two laps have been a 19-1 and an 18-2. And Will's not making any further inroads here. Brent Foley hasn't made any inroads into Mitch Hathaway either. They've been sort of pegging at similar lap times. 19-3 for Hathaway last time around. 19-5 for Foley. In actual fact, Foley's sector one this lap is some six tenths slower than Mitch Hathaway as well. So that we saw Foley have a little bit of an issue going into turn four. So he's probably lost a little bit of time there as well. But we'll stay with this man. I know we've, brought, we've covered him on the broadcast quite a fair bit tonight. But he's just been in an absolute class of his own hands and he's got one more lap to run. White flag in the air for the number 47. Final lap now for Kurt Stenberg. Underway. 78th lap of 78. Here we go. Through the centre chicane. Up to turn three now. He's still pushing really hard, Steve. So he looked like he was going to go into the fence there. He's just trying to put on a show for us. But Kurt Stenberg, he's absolutely brained them tonight. Just He's just come out swinging. He's come out guns are blazing And uh, he's put it to great effect on the ZB Commodore. And uh, he's really turning the afterburners on with the lead that he's uh, created up on Will Devonish. He's trying to slide it a little bit now, put a bit of a show for those watching. He's just having some fun now. Point. Just having some fun now, as I said earlier. He's got a bit of a point to prove at the moment. Slide through turn number eight. He didn't get to run an ASC on Tuesday night. He was pretty miffed about that. He was very, very upset with the power company not having any power at ha the home to compete in any of those two races so he started that series with zero points on the board but he's going to start this series the Automobilist Australia Supercars Championship for 2020 with a race win and 300 magnificent points and he will be the championship leader at the conclusion of tonight's proceedings Kurt Stenberg Trans Tasman racing victory in the opening race and the opening round of AMS Oz Supercars for 2020. Fantastic drive. Perfect start to the season if you can script one like that. Now we're looking at Will Devonish, a gallant effort. He's uh, tried to bring it to bring it to the challenge of Kurt Stenberg and he unfortunately he's just fallen short and uh, I guess the whole uh, thing on his rear wing, I guess it could describe how, uh, I guess don't go there. <laughs> yes, we know what it says on the rear wing. We don't want to go there. And you can get a look at it right there, people. There it is. And, uh, well, he said, you know, said that equation. But yeah, I, I, I know think, where you're going about this. I think, I think, I think that's happened to him tonight, unfortunately. So I, a bit of humour, but that's not what he was going for tonight. But uh, Mitch this, Hathaway, yeah. pretty good effort. Pretty good tactical masterstroke in terms of the uh, strategy. And if yeah, he's further drive. up the grid... Yep. And, and a good drive as well, yeah. So if he was further up the grid, it would have been working out a lot better for him. So congratulations to our top three place getters. Stayed Just with that strategy. Stayed with the strategy that we, we thought about earlier in the night, that three-stop strategy. Everybody else around him did a four-stop and still managed to get home. He's managed to make that three-stop strategy work and converted it into a podium. So he'd be really, really happy with that. Foley would be probably not so happy with what's happened to his car, but he's recovery-driven that one into fourth place after a battle that's lasted quite a while with Scott Nolan. So Scott has actually crossed the line a so lap he's, down, he's a lap I think. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it was a lap down to the race leader after all of that. So he gets home for fifth, first of the lap runners. Lewis Wedding got up to sixth mm. eventually, and then Termo eventually found his way to P7, Cam Rutledge eighth. Dwayne Davies inside the ten. And then Steve Burko and Billy Dougal Salong are the last couple of drivers to finish this race. Now, there's a little something new that the drivers are hopefully been told in the driver's briefing for tonight. And that's that they need to make their way to the end of pit lane for a top three photo. So Kurt Stenberg already well and truly in place. Here comes Will Devonish and Mitch Hathaway just uh, still a little bit further away. A little bit of a new initiative, very similar to what they do in supercars in the real life. They get them all to line up at the pit lane. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the one, two, three out in front. It would be nice because I, I reckon a few blokes would be hitting them. Hitting the old signs, I should say. 
But uh, actually, I'm impressed with Turmo's recovery because he's managed to get up into the top 10. I mean, not that many cars running, but he's managed to finish the race only a couple of laps down after a disastrous first lap. He did kind of get terminated on the first lap, which is what it says on his rear wing, but not quite, not quite in terms of the race. He actually managed to finish up there, so good job, Turmo, for sticking with it. I know he doesn't say much, but uh, you know, if I said good job, Turmo, he'd be like, yep. Yeah. Well, Foley's driven straight into the garage forwards. There is your top three in the pit lane. So third place on the left, second place in the middle, first place on the right. So great result for all three drivers to open their accounts for this season. Unfortunately, the, uh, the cameras don't do us sort of too much justice trying to get the right angle from what we're looking at, but we'll, uh, we'll take a few photos later. They'll be present on the Facebook page for Automobilist Australia. So we'll, oops, so we'll leave it at that. And we will, I guess, take a little bit of a breath here, Hans, because we have just witnessed the, probably one of the longer races we've seen to open any race in Automobilist Australia over the last couple of years. And it's resulted in a pretty decent finish for Kurt Stenberg aboard at number 47. Not the brutally uncompromising fashion that you would have seen for the likes of Brenton Foley uh, in the last couple of races we've seen him do, such as the Bathurst race, where he, as you called it, brutally uncompromising. Um, but what are your thoughts coming out of tonight? Uh, I reckon our top performer tonight is Kurt Stenberg, probably rightfully so, and maybe not much of a surprise there, but I, I guess the ability to be able to go from pole position with a blistering lap time, uh, it was actually the last car out in the shootout, uh, so provisional pole p position in qualifying, pole position in the top 10 shootout, and then now he's uh, converted that into a race win, and uh, you couldn't get a better start to a season than that, so Stenberg, he knows... He knows how to operate the car, and he knows how to uh, wring its neck, and he's gotten absolutely 100% out of it uh, tonight. So really impressed with his effort. Uh, I'm also going to mention uh, Termo for just being able to stick with it and Lewis Wedding uh, to be able to come from the back, and uh, Lewis Wedding uh, up there in sixth and Termo in seventh. So Termo uh, spun around on the first lap, stuck with it, did come home about a couple of laps down. Lewis Wedding one lap down. It didn't go ideally for them in the end, but they did manage to finish the race and get a good haul of points, Steve. What about yourself? What do you think? Who is our top performer? Well, clearly the the race winner probably is the top performer. As we said, he's led pretty much 75% or more of the race tonight. Pretty much got all the accolades aside from leading all the laps. So one accolade short of the Grand Schlem. Um, the safety car definitely helped Termo. Uh, tonight, that safety car came out not long after the incident at turn four on the opening lap, so yeah, that helped him catch up a little bit. Looks like he got away with not having too much damage, so to finish P7 is very, very uh, good for him. And as we said, you know, Mitch Hathaway started a, bit, a little bit further down the order than he probably would have liked, but made that strategy work when the safety car came out. Everybody else eventually went on to a four stop strategy, he did turn that three stop strategy into a third place. So we might start with the driver of the number 31, Mitch Hathaway. Um, as we just said, Mitchell, a good run for yourself. You made that strategy work for you where others decided to come in and uh, take a little bit of a gamble, stopping a little bit earlier than expected. Yeah, that's right. I just ducked to my guns there and um, yeah, glad it worked out in the end. So well, yeah, pretty lucky. Well, you're certainly no stranger to what's happened here on the streets of Adelaide before. Of course, last year you had that very, very famous drive from the back of the grid uh, to the very, very front and won that race, which is the, the lowest ever starting position that we've had a Supercars victory here in AMS Oz as well. So uh, welcome back to the podium because we haven't actually seen you up here for quite some time. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, podiums are going to be hard to come by this year, so I'll, I'll take it. And I definitely love this track, so it's good to be on the podium here. Obviously not a win, but, uh, you know, I'm going to take it. It's a great result for me tonight, so. There certainly is. And uh, what's it like driving a Ford this year compared to the Holden? Of course, you're well and truly entrenched in a camp with uh, several Fords at the moment under, I guess, what we say, the umbrella of Lewis Wedding and a bunch of other really, really good drivers as well. So there's probably a lot that you're learning off of each other, I'd imagine, as well, being in such a large team. Yeah, that's right. It's good to bounce off a couple of other guys and... Um help them out as well while they they help us out 
the transition between the hole and the forward has been pretty easy. So um, I'm actually going a lot quicker this year. So, yeah, a lot of potential for the season ahead. Good on you, mate. Looking forward to see what you've got in store over the course of the next 15 or so races. Hans is with our second place getter here. Down here with Gil, Will Devonish. And, uh, Will, a very gallant effort tonight. You've uh, put in everything you've got, but unfortunately not enough for the might of Kurt Stenberg. No. Uh, uh, did what I could to sort of fuel save to cut a pit stop out of it. Um, but, yeah, not enough uh, to catch him. Still a pretty solid second place, though. A good start to the season. Yes, I, I'm really happy with the, the second place and I'm happy with the team. All cars finishing in the top 10, so can't really complain with that. Yeah, really good showing tonight. Congratulations, Will, on your second place. Hard fought second place. Well done. Thank you. Steve is up with our race winner now, so uh, Steve will take you to our race winner, Kurt Stenberg. Sure, Will. Stenny, I guess there's really no other way to describe it, but you probably had a little bit of a point to prove after missing those couple of ASC races on Tuesday night with what happened at, uh, with the power or lack thereof over at your place, but you came out, blazed a trail, and uh, pretty much controlled the race from start to finish aside from the pit stops. Yeah, exactly right, mate. After missing those two races, I was pretty hungry to get out on track because it was pretty disappointing to not be able to have a go in those races, so... Yeah, I wanted to come out and do the best I could. Not having those races under my belt meant that I was made a few errors and I wasn't as consistent as I would have liked, especially near the start of the race. But as the race went on, the pace picked up and we, we just flew on with it. Yeah, well, you have set a new track record, of course, in qualifying. You've also set now the new race lap record for AMS Oz here as well. So that's another feather in your cap to go along with the race victory tonight. On the topic of pushing a little bit too hard and making a few of those mistakes. We did see you get the wall on a couple of occasions. We did see a pretty significant one off of the exit of Turn 11 that I think you're probably lucky to get away with it. It wasn't as serious as it actually was. Um, what do you put that down to? Do you put it down to just your match fitness, just pushing a little bit too hard, a little bit of combination of both? Yeah, a bit of match fit, fitness. I mean, I haven't done a race that long for quite a while either. So, yeah, a bit of that, a bit of pushing a bit too hard. I knew I was I was pushing hard because I knew that I'd worked out on about lap 35 or so that Will was going to be doing a pit stop less. So I wanted to push as hard as possible because I wanted to make sure that when I did the splash and dash, I came out in front of him and I didn't know how it was going to work out, how long the stop was going to be. But uh, we ended up managing to do that, which was pretty good. No, you've done certainly well. You've opened your account really well. Now, from what we understand, you're only going to you're going to run as as many races as you possibly can. Um, can we look forward to seeing you uh, a fair bit more this year, or is it sort of going to get in the way with a few other commitments that you've got? I reckon I'll be here for quite a few of the races. I, I reckon I'll be here for most of the rounds, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure of what it will, when it will be. But yeah, I aim to do most of them. Well, we'll certainly look forward to seeing a little bit more of you and for all of those of you watching at home and watching this back a bit later on, the man to beat, you've got to get on board and have a look at what he does. If you want to beat the man, you've got to, or you want to be the man, you've got to beat the man. So, Stenny, again, big congratulations on race victory. 300 points in the bank and we'll look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. No worries. Thanks, guys. Look forward to seeing you then. Hans, let's close this one down. It's been a long night, but it's been a, a pretty good start to the season. Oh, he's uh, just taking a little bit of time here, I think. What's, uh, yeah, I was talking to oh, you. Yes, I was talking to you, Hans. Oh, you, you actually want me to say something this time? No, it's been a fantastic night. A very good start to the season for Kurt Stenberg and a very good start to the season for Outworld Broadcasting. Nice to say that this is my home for another year commentating AMS on supercars and it's fantastic to see everyone back on track again in new cars, new faces, new colours. It's fantastic. Thanks, buddy. Let's have a look at the supercars calendar because this is what lies ahead. So the Adelaide 250 is done and dusted. The 12th of March is where the Melbourne Twin Sprint comes into play. Now, I know that that is a little bit earlier than expected, but I believe there's been a couple of scheduling conflicts that have brought that forward. So in actual fact, we are not going to be necessarily be seeing you in a couple of weeks. We're actually going to be seeing you in approximately two weeks instead of about three or four like we would normally be following the the Australian uh, supercars calendar. We'd normally be doing the Thursdays after that, but this one's been brought forward due to a few scheduling conflicts. So two more weeks, and Hans will be back, and I will be back as well. 
The rest of the calendar is all laid out there for you on the screen. Of course, the big one that we're all looking forward to is at number 12 there, the Bathurst 1000. A few little things still being worked out. We'll hope to bring you some more info on that in the next couple of months. But until then, it's time to close it down for the night. Please drive safely, everybody, and we'll see you in approximately two weeks for supercars. But a couple of days prior to that, we will see you for the first round of the GT3 World Series. So until next time, bye for now.